It's unusual during these uh, pandemic times. This meeting has been held virtually uh, with members of the committee in various homes and offices throughout the northeast um, and streamed live on YouTube for purposes of uh, public openness and accountability. I'm aware that we may have uh, a significantly higher number of members of the public joining us this uh, this morning due to a lot of interest in some of the items on the agenda today. Uh, so I would ask uh, all of the members uh, around the uh, committee on the screens to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Matthew Wormsley, I'm GP in South Tyneside and Chair of this governing body and I'll ask Neil to introduce himself next. Good morning, I'm uh, Dr Neil O'Brien. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer and Countable Officer for um, South Tyneside CCG. Jeanette. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeanette Scott and I'm the Executive Nurse for Quality, Executive Nurse and uh, Cover Quality and Safety at South Tyneside CCG. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Hall, the Director of Public Health for South Tyneside. Pat. Good morning, uh, lay member, uh, South Tyneside CCG. Tarquin Cross. Good morning, I'm Dr Tarquin Cross. I'm a consultant geriatrician. I work at North Tyneside Hospital. I'm the secondary care clinician on the governing body. Uh, apologies, I haven't got a camera today, um, but I can hear and see everything. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Brown. Morning, I'm Matt Brown. I'm Director of Operations here at South Tyneside CCG. Kate Hudson. Morning, I'm Kate Hudson. I'm the Chief Finance Officer and Chief Officer for the CCG. Louise Lydon. Good morning, I'm Louise Lydon. Vicky Patterson. Good morning, I'm Vicky Pattinson, Head of Adults for South Tyneside Council and Head of Commissioning for South Tyneside Council and South Tyneside CCG. John Whitehouse. Good morning, I'm the Lame Member and Audit Chair for the CCG. Thank you. Those are the, uh, the members of the committee. We have a number of other people on the call with us today. Uh, so we also have Keith Haynes. Good morning, yep, Keith Haynes, the uh, Governance Advisor Consultant to the CCG. We have Andy Sutton. I'm Andy Sutton, I'm the CCG's Governance Officer. A very important person for taking the notes of this meeting. Deb Cornell. Hi, I'm Sam Deb Cornell. I'm Head of Corporate Affairs for Sunderland CCG and I'm just here observing today. I think Ben Landon's also on the call as well. Good morning, yes, Ben Landon. I support the CCG with communications. Thanks very much, colleagues. Um, I know that took a little bit while longer than we uh, we normally take over those uh, those things, but I think it was uh, worth doing this morning. We do have a, uh, a packed agenda. We have apologies for absence from Paul Cuskin, uh, our lay member for uh, public and patient involvement, who's very sorry that he couldn't be here today. Uh, and I don't know if we've received apologies from Sue Ross. I presume Vicky is attending in Sue Ross's uh, place as, as a deputy. Now then, can I ask uh, colleagues to declare uh, any interest that they uh, they may have? Uh, we'll note the usual standing declarations of interest from uh, myself and uh, Neil O'Brien as, as GPs, from uh, Pat Hall as a member of uh, Sunderland CCG's governing body, and from John Whitehouse as a member of Durham's governing CCG's governing body. Uh, if anybody has any other declarations that need to be made, then now is the time to do so. Uh, Matthew, probably it's, it's worth noting, obviously, I am also the accountable officer for Sunderland CCG and County Durham CCG, so therefore members of their governing body too. Thanks, Neil, for reminding me of that. Um, can we take then the, uh, the draft minutes of the last meeting on the uh, 23rd of July for accuracy and matters arising at the same time, page by page, please, if you don't mind. So page one. Page two, 
page three, page four, page five. So, sorry, Matthew, I had put my hand up, but instead sorry, of you, I, can't I, can't see everybody, I can't see everybody on my screen, so you may have to shout up if I seem to ignore yeah. you. I'll make sure I do that in future. It's going back to page two of the page four of the pack. Um, the heading um, staff is the inspection of South Tyneside and Sunderland Foundation Trust mentions infection control, but the reference infection control is, is irrelevant. It, it's just covering the inspection of the Trust. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeanette. Uh, Andy, if you could amend that, that would be great. Matthew, sorry to interrupt. Apologies. There is a little bit of feedback from your uh, microphone when it's not muted. Sorry, so that might, may not have been clear to all, all members. Okay, so that was um, a change in the um, uh, title of the CQC inspection on page two there. Um, I've got to be, you have to keep me right if I, if I uh, don't unmute. I'm using some different technology, which doesn't seem to be quite as good as the uh, the usual technology the time that I have used in the past, unfortunately. Um, so that was page five we're up to, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, and page ten. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I've just spotted something on page six. I do apologise. It's just um, under the financial management um, item 2020 slash 37. Um, I think the uh, <laughs> the acronym, acronym the, the abbreviation of, a, of the title of a, an organisation, I can't think of the right word this morning. Um, you've got it says um, the CCG budget had been submitted to government, to government body in advance of HEFCE's temporary financial arrangements. I think that probably means NHSE slash I. Um, I don't know what HF, HEFCE is. I think it's probably a different organisation entirely. That's my error. Um, I've been thinking back to when I worked in higher education. I apologise. <laughs> OK, we'll just change that. Thanks, Andy. Matthew. Yes, Patty, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry about this. I was desperately trying to attract your attention at on page four, which is at the top of page four, progress and recovery, it's uh, states, and it's the um, the third paragraph, second bullet point. I just want to um, sort of make it clear that the next informal meeting of the Quality Patient Safety Committee is uh, is looking at sort of experience um, and challenges going forward from a number of viewpoints across a range of sectors but it isn't it as it's stated there from all major stakeholders it's just to clarify um, what we're actually trying to achieve at the next meeting which is to ensure that we've got uh, going forward the appropriate assurance mechanisms thank you pat um, uh, um sorry that I to you in time. I, I must apologise. People, you, you will have to uh, shout rather than, uh, than raise hands or use the uh, the raise hands icons and, and take them down again if you wish to attract my attention because I, I cannot see everybody uh, at once on my screen and a number of you have got uh, cameras turned off as well so if you do wave your hands but have your camera turned off uh, I'm not going to be able to work uh, to see you at all. Okay. Does anybody have anything else we need to amend with those minutes before we do move on? Okay, thanks very much. That took a little bit longer than uh, the usual. The next item on the agenda is question time from members of the public. Now, we have had uh, an unprecedentedly huge number of questions put through by email um, for this, uh, this governing body meeting. Um, we're unfortunately not going to be able to read out every single question. Um, and in fact, what, uh, what I would propose that we do is we spend a few minutes at this, uh, this point of the meeting addressing some of the generic questions that, uh, that a lot of people asked, um, unsurprisingly, about uh, end-of-life care uh, and that, uh, that item on the agenda. Um, 
we'll try to cover a lot of the more detailed questions that were asked when we cover the paper later on um, in, the, uh, in, in the meeting. Please be sure that all members of the have seen all the questions submitted by email. They have been circulated, so all points raised have been raised to all the members of the governing body, and they're all aware uh, of, uh, of the concerns that people have. Um, any uh, issues that we are unable to deal with, we will get back when people have asked very specific questions. We will undertake to uh, to email them uh, and provide a written response to them. Um, because we do really appreciate this, uh, this level of engagement. So uh, I hope that uh, people are, are content with that as a, a uh, slightly different uh, process from usual, but we really couldn't get on with any business today if we were going to spend the time uh, that each of the questions uh, that has been asked um, would, uh, would normally have. So I do apologise for that, uh, that slight difference, um, but I think that's probably the best way to, to manage things. As I said, a lot of the questions asked were about um, the uh, the end of life uh, paper, uh, and the, uh, the very many of them were along the lines of uh, essentially why did we close St Clair's Hospice? Um, now, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of detail about what went on with St Clair's, um, and I think I'll ask Matt Brown perhaps to uh, to, to just give people a brief. Uh, outline of the, of the past and, and what happened there. So Matt, can I uh, hand over to you for that? Yeah, thanks Matty and hopefully you can hear me hear me okay. I, I think this is a really important question. So I think there's a lot of misinformation that's actually out in the public domain at the minute. Um, so I think the first thing is the NHS did not close St Clair's Hospice. St Clair's Hospice very sadly closed due to insolvency in January 29. So it was an independent charity and unfortunately, because of issues with its finances, it wasn't able to continue um, continue operating as a going concern. And that was a real blow for many people across South Tyneside. It existed for 30 years and had supported lots and lots of uh, uh, patients. Many people have written to us talking about the experience that their loved ones have had. So it was a really, really sad time for everybody in, in South Tyneside. But I think we have to be clear that it has closed. It closed because of insolvency and it no longer exists. So for the last two years, there has not been a hospice in South Tyneside and there are no dedicated end of life beds at the minute in South Tyneside. And that's why we're putting forward the model we're proposing later on. It's a new model. It's not about moving services because those services are not there. It's about starting to build a new future for palliative care in South Tyneside. So just in a nutshell, St Clair's Hospice closed because of insolvency, I'm afraid. Thanks, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, a lot of people have been asking, even though the the hospice is closed, the the building is still there. Why can that building not be uh, not be just simply reopened? Yeah, again, we've had a lot of questions on that on that point, um, Matthew, and, and and we genuinely really understand the feelings that people hold and the high esteem that people hold St Clair's um, St Clair's Hospice in. Um, unfortunately, because of its structure, its working practices, its its fundraising position, its struggle with staffing and finances over a really long period of time. Um, in 2018, it was forced to close for a month because of issues with medical staffing, so it didn't have enough doctors. And in September 2018, it closed for three months after it was rated inadequate by CQC. We worked really hard to get the hospice reopened, but sadly in, in January 20, 2019, it, it closed due to insolvency. Well, I think that is the point that it, it has closed and that means there is no hospice in South Tyneside, as I said, and there are no beds. So, yes, there is a building, but there is no entity. There is no organisation to run services. There are no doctors, no nurses, no housekeepers, no carers, bedding, catering, medical supplies, no equipment, furniture, drugs, medicines. There is not an entity that can run services from there. And we talked to a lot of hospices in the last couple of weeks about the position they find themselves in, particularly post-COVID, and it is incredibly challenging right now financially for the hospice sector. Real difficulties for very established um, hospices, including Macmillan nationally, um, let alone trying to start afresh with a new organisation. So in order to provide the range of services we need um, to make sure we can genuinely recruit the staff we need with a financially sustainable and real world model, um, we've had to look at something different. So you'll see in the proposal, we're talking about firstly, really substantial investment in community services where the vast majority of people are supported um, at the end of life. 
Um, secondly, um, some dedicated ensuite bedrooms uh, in a dedicated facility in Haven Court, where we think we can have a really homely, respectful place and, and deliver a really good standard of care for the future. So I'm afraid, unfortunately, there is not an entity in, in, in um, Primrose Hill that we could that we could work with to move forward. An awful lot of people uh, were concerned about the potential environment uh, differences between the Primrose Hill building and the, the Haven Court building. Uh, I, I wonder, Jeanette, as our, our uh, quality uh, quality executive, whether you'd like to comment on the uh, the, different, the the environment at, at Haven Court for us before we move any further on. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Yes, I think it's important to recognise that Haven Court isn't actually a hospital building or it doesn't run hospital services. There's two different elements currently to um, Haven Court and the environment was set up specifically around that. So it was already an environment with um, people with dementia in mind from both a rehabilitation point of view, but there's also some care home type beds so that the Haven Court's registered, it has registered care home beds already. And as, as everybody will recognise, people who reside in a care home, that's their home, and it's often their choice to end their days in their place, their place of choice, which is the care home. So the beds within um, the care home part of Haven Court have already been providing end of life care to the people who reside there. So it isn't something completely new, but just to be clear, these beds are completely separate from that. These are dedicated palliative care and end of life beds, and they won't be used for any other purpose. And the staffing model will be specifically around providing that level of care and not sort of generic care. And it's really important to recognise that. Thank you, Jeanette. I mean, there was an awful lot more questions along the lines of uh, the, the numbers of beds in the proposed model uh, and the uh, the detail around the, uh, the finances for the proposed model, which I would propose we uh, we cover whilst we're discussing the uh, the paper itself. Um, uh, and um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss most of the detail there. There was one further question, uh, members, that submitted that there wasn't about uh, the, uh, the end of life proposals. That was a question on uh, on talk before you walk, uh, which uh, governing body members will have seen at the, uh, the the final page of the uh, the list of questions that was submitted, um, uh, and um, it, it was uh, again a question on uh, uh, mentioning um, no one being turned away from A and E, but, but, but mentioning a case where somebody apparently was turned away from some of an eye infirmary or rather was asked to phone from outside the eye infirmary um, because the uh, the doors were closed there. Um, Neil, I don't know whether you would feel able to uh, to respond to that question at, at this point. Yes, Matthew, I'm happy to do that. Um, uh, I mean, I can't really comment on the exact nature of that particular case. Um, I suspect that may have something to do with um, uh, preventing crowding in um, in what is probably a small emergency um, eye uh, casualty um, by for, for patients to make appointments for that. That's probably related to COVID restrictions, probably um, then talk before uh, you walk. Um, because talk before you walk um, is not yet fully operational within our within our area. It is an exciting development talk before you walk, um, uh, and I understand um, the, the the concerns people have. But the model does not turn people away from the front door at A and E. It actually um, uh, would uh, hopefully improve the service uh, for the vast majority of patients who need urgent treatment but not immediate treatment. Um, uh, so uh, you could, rather than sitting in an A&E department for four or five hours, you will be given a time slot to attend. Again, that is going to be even more important um, in a COVID environment. The last thing we want are vulnerable people crowding in A&E departments. Um, so it will help us manage winter, um, but it will also help us manage um, uh, some COVID safety issues as well. 
I'm, uh, I'm happy to bring um, uh, further more detailed reports on talk before you walk to future governing bodies if members feel that that's uh, needed. But there is a working group established. Um, uh, we will be communicating with the public um, when uh, when this becomes operational. And also just to note, this is now not going to be just a local pilot. Um, uh, nationally, this will be this will be rolled out at pace to help the NHS manage through COVID and winter. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, at, at that point, I'm going to draw a line under this uh, this item. We are getting well over time, uh, having spent that time on, on those questions, so we must move on. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Accountable Officers Information Report. Um, we can take that report, I'm sure, as being read by uh, all members of the governing body. Uh, but Neil, I wonder if there's any particular highlights that you'd like to draw our attention to before we invite questions. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Again, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, 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 the full report. Um, uh, there's lots of um, uh, information in in there both from uh, national and uh, local updates. Uh, just the one thing that might have pricked a lot of people's att uh, attention is the COVID vaccine section that I've put in the report. Um, uh, just to say that I am on the National Clinical Advisory Group for the uh, COVID vaccine. Um, planning is well underway um, so that once this vaccine is available and um, uh, to, to be given to the general public, then our region will be ready to get out and um, uh, administer that in the most efficient way possible. We haven't got timescales um, on, on that yet, but as I'm sure governing body and the public would expect, our planning for this has to start well before the vaccine is available. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll keep everyone up to date, obviously, um, uh, uh, as and when I can. But the rest of the report there describes a little bit about ICP level working and the changing way in which we're collaborating um, across uh, the ICS. But um, I don't think there's anything more for me to say and happy to take any questions if there are any. Colleagues, any questions for Neil on the content of the report? Yes, thank you. Um, obviously, it was a, a, a very comprehensive report. Um, I, I, it was good to learn um, of the ICP Clinical Leadership Group with senior clinical leaders from both CCGs and FTs working together um, to ensure effective and safe services, the future requirements, and support effective integration and pathway development across the system. And I, and I very much welcome that. And uh, very in particular to hear of the, um, the sort of clinical input into that. I note in, um, I think it's one, two, three, sorry, that the group will feed into the ICP executive and then into the local arrangements. And I just wondered in terms from a quality and safety um, governance perspective, has that structure been uh, sorted out yet or is that sort of uh, a future direction? Uh, thanks, uh, Pat. The the, um, the clinical leadership group um, is is just being established. I've just in the last month taken over the chairmanship of the ICP executive, which, to tell you the truth, um, was uh, stood stood down during COVID because we had command and control structures in place to manage the um, uh, the, the the COVID pandemic. So we're starting to get that back up and running again, and I'm actually refreshing that structure because I think what we need to really understand is what um, uh, where um, a, a possible ICP executive sits within our own governance structures because an ICP is not a statutory organization the governing bodies are um, and I don't think quality um, and uh, patient safety is well enough represented on the current ICP executive so I am working on that with members across the ICP and I'll come back um, with a further update um, on that um, uh, so yes it's kind of work in progress Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Pat, for the question. Uh, Matt, did you want to? Thanks, Matthew. I guess it was just a brief point to, to note the volume of work that actually has been undertaken in a really challenging time um, with COVID. So I think this report really nicely sets out the work around integration of cancer and the life care, frailty, care homes, long term conditions. Uh, I work with primary care networks and so on. And I, I think it's a really good reflection of a really significant volume of work has been undertaken, say, in a very challenging period. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, it, it does. It, it does. I mean, it's that there is a, there is a lot going on at the minute, and 
all parts of the NHS are working exceptionally hard to ensure that we both manage the um, uh, COVID pandemic and um, ensure that we continue with quality improvement and access to vital NHS services, which is a challenge but I don't think we could work any harder on that. And uh, everyone that, I, that we work with in the CCG and health service are completely committed to that. Thanks, uh, colleagues, and thanks, Neil. Uh, I can't see anybody else trying to attract my attention on the screen. So if you have been and I haven't seen you, then please, now's the time to shout. But otherwise, we will move on to the, uh, the next item on the agenda. Uh, which is the key assurance and risk report from quality and safeguarding. And I think Jeanette's going to talk us through this once again. Jeanette, the, uh, the report has been read by all, so brief highlights and time for discussion would be great. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. I think the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first thing to note is that this is the first time that this information has been presented in this format. Um, the two previous meetings, I think we, we had moved to a verbal update, but following feedback, we've returned to a written update, but in a different format. And again, we, we're really keen to receive some um, feedback around this format. Um, because we're always keen to improve. I'm going to be as um, brief as I possibly can because the information's there. So some key points that I think it's worth um, mentioning. As you'll see, there's, there's this assurance on the left-hand side and some key highlights to bring the, uh, people's attention on the right-hand side. Um, the one thing that I would like to say is that during the COVID uh, restrictions and lockdown, we have continued our air quality assurance processes in some format or other, and so have NHS England and NHS Improvement from a regional perspective. So we continue to um, seek and gain assurance um, on from organisations, but also other processes have continued. And I think it's important to know that. I think one of the other important things that I would like to um, to bring attention to is the work that we've done around infection prevention and control. So we now have a service specification for a service that will operate uh, supporting care homes and community and primary care medical services, particularly from the 1st of October, the beginning of October. And I think that's really important. Um, and I'm really glad that we've got that in place. And I'm looking forward to seeing the output of some of that. And um, as you can imagine, with um, the COVID being continually um, at the forefront of our attention, infection prevention control is really important. Um, and we I'll continue to give updates around that um, in coming meetings. On the right um, of that, we I have a team update, and that's just to give an um, update. Previously, we have reported some, con not concerns, but we, we brought attention to the fact that we had some vacancies that we were in the process of filling, and I'm really glad to say that the vast majority of those people are now in post, um, or are due to start very soon, and the information's on the right-hand side. Um, in terms of safeguarding, generally we have a new way of working around our stat with our statutory partners, and there's some information around that about the partnership working and the, the board and the um, children's partnership coming together. Um, another important point is that we have secured um, and appointed a temporary post around domestic abuse and health advocacy to work into both the emergency department and the midwifery service, which again is really important um, because of um, the impact of COVID and the social restrictions that um, it's potentially having. We know from um, national figures on people who are the, the victims of domestic abuse. Um, some other information there around um, some national um, initiatives such as patient safety specialists and we also had World Patient Safety Day but I am happy to take questions from anybody. Thanks very much Janetta and I do particularly like the, uh, the format of the report, I find it very, uh, very easy to read and uh, hopefully it was easier to produce as well than some of the, uh, the previous reports so uh, Congratulations to the team for that. Uh, any questions, colleagues, for Jeanette on the uh, the content? Yes, Matt. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of comments and a couple of questions, if I may, Jeanette. Um, but before that, yes, I I thought the yeah, format was excellent. Thank you. 
Um, it was good to see the MOU developed uh, to ensure sustainability and resilience regarding uh, delivery of quality safeguarding and patient safety, as well as infection prevention and control across the ICP. It's, uh, it was good to see the established learning from Deaths Collaborative Group and that uh, the CCG are a member. And I just wondered if uh, who else is on that group. And the other question I have is um, any update regarding the national guidance for patient transport services and the application of the two metre distance and because and, your know, patient transport is quite uh, crucial to um, patients. OK, I hope I can remember. I should have noted that down. So thank you for your comments and I'll ensure that I feed back to Kirsty Hesketh and the support from the next team around the, the change format because it, it was Kirsty and, and the team at Next who produced that and I will make sure that they receive that feedback. Um, in terms of the memorandum of understanding, I absolutely agree. I think it's really important. We need to have resilience across our, um, our ICP, our integrated care partnership and we've, we've put this, uh, we've draft, drafted up this um, memorandum of understanding, which is still has to go through governance and be agreed, but um, has been agreed in principle um, by the, the respective organisations um, in order to have resilience and to have specialist um, advice available across our ICP. Um, the next question you asked about, was it the learning from deaths or was there a question before that, Pat? No, it was to ask who else was on the group. So, so it's provider organisations. So, um, so there's, um, it, t it tends to be people who carry out the review. Oh, the, the, sorry, the um, learning from deaths in the, um, I'm, my head's jumping into leader. I do apologise. So the learning from uh, deaths group, Matthew's probably in a better position to answer that question because he's a member of that because it's, um, it's a range of clinicians. There's a multidisciplinary panel um, in the trust and Matthew's probably better placed to tell you what that range of um, clinicians and um, professionals are. So yeah, that's the likes of the uh, the medical director, the um, uh, the trust. It's the uh, the doctor who chairs their mortality review group, uh, and some of the uh, the people who support the mortality review process within the trust, and the uh, the public health uh, consultant working at the trust. Uh, myself as uh, as primary care and CCG representative. Uh, uh, in the main, I think that's uh, that's the, the main members. Thanks. And there was a final question, Jeanette, and that was around patient transport services. Yeah, sorry, Pat. Yes, I knew there was another one. So the patient transport services nationally, there's um, there's been challenge back to the centre around the two. Uh, uh, the two metre ruling and patient transport in line with the, um, the national guidance around recovery of services because as you would imagine the, the transport of patients in the hospital for appointments um, or, or even discharge home from hospital um, is significantly impacted by this two metre um, distance and rule. Um, it's been escalated nationally but the decision was made that unless there's a change in the um, the national guidance that the trust, the ambulance trust will continue to abide by um, the two metre ruling and will escalate any operational issues through the quality review group as and when necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Anyone else got any questions for Jeanette on that particular paper? Matt? Sorry, very briefly, uh, just the point about the um, the outbreak plan for flu in care homes. I think it's really, really helpful to see that because we had some difficulties last year, didn't we? So I think that'll be a real improvement for, for this year and um, hopefully that'll bring some further support to all the work we're doing around care homes this year. Thanks very much. Uh, OK, in that case, we'll uh, we'll accept that uh, that paper. Uh, before we do move on, uh, Jeanette, I know we've said it a number of times, but uh, Carol Drummond is, after several false starts, uh, finally is actually going to retire from the NHS. Uh, she will be a huge miss to the organisation and to, uh, to South Tyneside. So could I ask that you uh, ensure there's a formal letter goes from the governing body 
uh, to thank Carol for uh, for all the work and commitment that uh, that she's put in down the years. I think that's the very the very least we can do as she uh, as she leaves the uh, the NHS. Thank you, Chair. I will ensure. Um, Carol has now left. She finished um, earlier this week, and she will be. We have placed her with um, a, a, a excellent appointment, and um, I, I just we've all wished Carol well for her retirement. She she did a sterling job coming back and supporting us through a difficult time, and we were ever so grateful for that. Um, and she will be a miss because she's a colleague and a friend. But um, this is her time now, so I will ensure that we pass on uh, everybody's best wishes. But um, I'm actually really jealous that she, she's able. Well, once we get the other side of COVID, she's going to be able to do all the travelling that she had planned. Thank you. Um, we do need to move on to the uh, the Modern Slavery Act and statement, Jeanette. Um, I think this is. Um, you know, a paper that very much is what it is. Uh, yeah. It needs yeah. to be seen. It needs to be uh, um, taken by the governing body. Uh, if there's any, any key points that, uh, that you feel do need to be drawn out, then please do. Uh, otherwise, we can just accept the, uh, the, the, the request of the paper. Thank you, Matthew. It's an annual requirement. We have to um, publish um, our statement on the web CCG website so that this paper gives a brief overview and it's asking the governing body to approve that the statement be published on the website. I'm sure we can do that uh, without any further uh, discussion or questions. Can we move on to the, uh, the Learning Disability Mortality Review, the LEADER annual report? Um, and maybe anything that you want to, uh, to draw out on that or questions from, from colleagues. But, uh, Jeanette, over to you again. So again, in the interest of um, brevity, I will try to just, because it's actually, I have to say, um, I think this is an excellent report. Sharon Thompson was hoping to um, be here herself today, but she hasn't been able to, um, because I thought it was an opportunity for her to present this report, um, because she, it, I think it's excellent. But I'll, I will just pick out some key points that I think it's important to note um, before we um accept the report and then um, we have to agree to publish it as well as the the same as the um, modern slavery statement so this is a, a report this is an annual report for 2019-20 you um the front sheet um, talks about the local arrangements the governance the performance date we have the performance data um the the panel arrangements with the oversight and how we share learning and themes and the improvement outcomes and you will note, you will probably have noted a slight um, error um, in that it says SCCG instead of STCCG at the beginning on the front sheet, but also at the end of the report. That's because this is a joint report between South Tyneside and Sunderland. Um, Sharon's actually been working across both organisations, leading on the, the leader reviews, and so produced one report across both organisations. So you, you've actually got two front sheets because of but ease, it was all just done that way. Um, so just focusing on South Tyneside, noting the contents, and um, what we would like you to do is to agree the plans for the coming year, um, and also note that um, our aspiration to ensure that the voice of people with learning disabilities Disabilities in South Tyneside is embedded in our commissioning processes. So they're the key things to note. Um, so the, there's some really um, important information in the summary about the general population, about um, the 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 reviews that we've taken that have taken place for South Tyneside. So 13 were notified, uh, one removed, one was a child, um, and so there's details about. Um, how many were completed in what time scales. I think the important thing to note there is that we were restricted by the number of reviewers that we had. So um, it, it wasn't about commitment, it was about the availability of people to carry out those reviews. I think um, some of the important um, points is that you'll note from the report, 85% of people died in hospital. So I think that's um, a point of interest that we should uh, note. Um, that the highest causes of death were uh, pneumonia or aspiration pneumonia and then sepsis, um, and that many of the, the people who died had multiple conditions. We 
identified um, a couple of um, areas of focus to take forward, um, particularly around the review of antipsychotic drugs and antidepressants and also about annual health checks and screening. Um, and the in terms of the impact of COVID-19, nationally um the the reviews were paused um the reporting still took place but the the actual allocation of the reviews were paused during covid we now have have a piece of work ongoing with starting with the newly allocated ones and the the cases that um, are hi historic, we've got something in place to start um carrying out those reviews and catch up um by the end of the year um the report concludes with the CCG's commitment to leader, and we are very committed to that, to the programme, working with partners and the third sector. And um, if the governing body members are happy to approve the report, it will be uploaded on the CCG website. And one final comment is that um, we are working on an easy read version that will also be published on the website. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, it's a comprehensive report. Um, colleagues, any questions for Jeanette, or shall we simply just agree to, uh, to publish the report and uh, as requested? We'll take from the uh, the general lack of questions that everybody's uh, content there, Jeanette. So we will uh, move on, taking the, uh, the questions as answered in the affirmative that you uh, you put to us. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the COVID-19 pandemic update and outbreak management. Uh, I'm going to ask Tom Hall to, uh, to talk about this. Tom, I'm away. You have to go a bit earlier than, uh, than planned um, due to uh, dealing with, with COVID, I, I would imagine. Uh, you're also down on the agenda to give a partnership update uh, later on. I can't imagine that over the last month or two, your working life has been very much other than COVID. So if you are happy to roll that partnership update into your uh, your COVID uh, item, then that would be that would be great, I think. So Tom, over to you. Thanks, Matthew. And yes, yeah, so um, in terms of the broader partnership update, I mean, Vicky may have other things that she wants to add um, after I've finished talking, but but otherwise predominantly, I was just going to focus on COVID-19, if that's OK. Uh, and again, I think Matt would will probably want to come in uh, when I've just gone through a very brief presentation with you, if that's OK. Um, clearly, we're in a, a very uh, challenging situation in relation to COVID-19 uh, across the, the whole of the northeast, but in South Tyneside in particular. Um, I'm just going to pull up some slides. Hopefully, um, governing body members can see these. Can you give me a nod, Matthew, if you can see them? Yeah, great. OK, I'll just um, I'll just walk through these. Uh, because I think it's really important that governing body members are aware how the situation has changed uh, so significantly from the last time that we had a governing body update. Just to just to put that into context, when we last met as a governing body, um, we sad times I had. I'm just waving my cursor around here so you can see it. Sad times I had one of the lowest rates of COVID-19 uh, in the country as as a seven-day rolling rate of cases. Um, Obviously, you can see how dramatically that situation has changed, uh, where South Tyneside has uh, now one of the highest rates of COVID-19 in the country, which which very firmly uh, puts us on the government's watch list, as, as members will be aware. And obviously, it now means that as a region, as a local authority, seven, we are subject to additional interventions, even over and above uh, the prime minister's announcements uh, this week for additional interventions. Just to put these rates into context, uh, back in um, back in mid-August, before we saw the spike, we were we were seeing approximately about four cases of COVID-19 per week. Um, and when I look at the data that takes us from the 13th of September to the 19th of September, we had uh, 244 cases. So you can see quite how dramatically that's changed to the point where we're now accumulating cases of COVID-19 more quickly than, um, than we were during the first wave of the pandemic. There is some, just, just to put that a little bit more into context though, because uh, obviously that does look like a really dramatic shift. When we were testing in wave one um, of the virus uh, back in April and May time, we were, it was predominantly targeted testing. It was, 
it was testing of individuals who were admitted to hospital. We started to expand that into care home testing and obviously into health and social care workforce testing. It wasn't um, testing out there in the in the community. Um, members of the public couldn't get access to testing until later on in wave one when they started to introduce uh, what, what's called pillar two testing. That's where people can access a test through uh, the 119 number or through the government's portal. So although we've got a higher rate of COVID-19 uh, cases now, uh, we're not necessarily comparing apples with apples when looking at wave one and wave two. Arguably, uh, the, the rate of COVID-19 that we saw in the population in wave one was a, was a bit tip of the iceberg. So we weren't testing expansively in the community. And um, so we wouldn't have known about all the cases that were out there. Obviously, now we've got much more comprehensive access to testing out in the community. So you can see the differentiation in the colours here. So uh, during wave one, we were, we were heavily reliant on pillar one testing, which is NHS laboratories and Public Health England laboratories. Um, and obviously during wave wave two here, we, we are seeing a lot more uh, pillar two testing. So that's where it's taking place in the community. Just to put the surge in the context. So um, just wanted to show you um, the age groups that um, were were um, contracting uh, COVID-19. When we look at the the first week in September here, um, and then throughout uh, throughout the weeks in September, you can see that the uh, crude rate of cases was particularly high in the 18 to 34 year old category. So in the in younger populations, and what we're seeing is the the cases started to come through in younger younger people. Um, we were seeing um, cases associated with pubs and restaurants. It's not necessarily to say that people caught the virus at a pub or a restaurant, but obviously people were out and about and starting to socialize more. Um, and and also when you think about young people, um, they are much more likely to be in jobs where which require them to, to be physically present. They can't work from home perhaps in quite the same way. Um, so obviously the younger populations were ones who were getting back out uh, after the easement of lockdown measures and starting to socialize more and obviously getting back to work and 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 we saw the case numbers increase in the younger populations but then what we've seen since then is the the mix of cases diversify somewhat so rather than seeing um, predominantly young people now we're now seeing a real mixture of age categories including um, an increase in the over 65s um, which is worrying in one respect um, as we know that uh, people who are over the age of 65 are much more susceptible to um, to health harms of COVID-19. So we do need to monitor that very closely and continue the, to wrap around our care homes in particular and our more vulnerable populations to, to make sure we don't see a, a surge in, um, in COVID-19 related deaths as well. Um, just, to, just to put our uh, recent seven day rate into context in the Northeast, we do have the highest rate um, of uh, COVID-19 in the northeast at this point in time. However, what drove the local authority, uh, local authorities across uh, the Tyne and Weir area into Northumberland and, and obviously into Durham to act together was that we were seeing a surge across all those those local authorities. Interestingly, the Tees Valley at this point in time aren't quite experiencing the same surge in cases as the the seven local authorities uh, to the north of the northeast. Um, but uh, obviously they're, they're working very closely with us as well, but not subject to the same level of intervention. So as a local authority seven, we wanted to take proactive actions. We felt like further intervention was required, um, particularly in relation to household gatherings and, and people mixing in homes, which we know is the, uh, the predominant way that COVID is, is spreading at this point in time. But then obviously looking at the, um, the, the, um, the cases that were related to um, of the hospitality sector and starting to put some restrictions around table service and opening hours of uh, pubs and restaurants, which again was an important measure to help try and curb uh, the increase in cases that we've been seeing. Um, just a quick point on testing, because it's obviously a hot topic. Um, it's, this might be quite tricky for you to see, but this is both pillar one and pillar two um, in the past two weeks um, across the whole of the local authorities here. This bar here shows you the rate of testing in South Tyneside. Um, we have broadly comparable testing across the whole of the Northeast. You can see that Sunderland had a, uh, is, is, is testing the most in the Northeast, but South Tyneside um, 
is is there or thereabouts um, in in um, in comparison to other uh, colleagues in in the northeast. We have been enhancing testing during this period of time, as you might imagine, in line with our outbreak management plan. So we've had a mobile testing unit deployed in South Tyneside over the last few weeks, uh, and indeed we're going to have uh, two deployed over the uh, the next week, running in parallel uh, at both the the Little Haven car park and at the Temple Park car park as well. And we're all also working with Department of Health and Social Care to mobilise what's called a local testing site as well, uh, which will give us a, a semi-permanent fixture as we move into the winter uh, and means that the, there'll be indoor testing available as well as uh, those in the pop-up mobile testing units um, that we're currently deploying at the moment. That's all to make sure that people aren't having to travel for, for testing un unnecessarily. Um, but we do know there has been pressure nationally on the, the testing system um, and we just need to make sure that we are prioritising testing for, for those in the northeast and indeed in South Tyneside. And then just finally, before I open up to questions, um, I did mention that we need to make sure that we're, we're protecting those who are the most vulnerable to COVID-19. We saw during um, wave one of the pandemic um, uh, excess mortality um, in our populations. That's where we've seen extra deaths and these red bars show the, where deaths were um, where COVID-19 was mentioned on death certificates, and obviously that's been a, a, a hot topic of debate. Um, the we saw that we saw that excess mortality during wave one of the virus, and since then, our mortality rates in South Tyneside, um, following the same trend as the northeast and England, have have largely may, remained uh, below the average that we would usually expect to see. So we've been seeing less deaths in South Tyneside than we would usually expect to see. One thing we'll be monitoring closely is that this doesn't increase as a result in the recent surge in cases. We, we are aware, though, that sadly we have had um, some COVID-19 related deaths at the Foundation Trust. They've, they've been announced and, and obviously we hope that that's not an indication that we're going to see a surge in those um, in, in those excess death rates that, that we saw during, during wave one of the virus. But clearly we work very uh, closely together as a system and making sure that we wrap around those who are more vulnerable um, at this point in time, particularly focusing in on our care homes and our, our care population. Um, and we, we took that difficult uh, decision to, to recommend to our care homes to, to cease uh, all unnecessary visiting during this period of time. And that's one of the, the key strategies in order to, to prevent care, uh, uh, COVID uh, being reintroduced into our care homes. Um, and, and that's kind of one of the key strategies we need to keep employing to, to make sure that we're all wrapping around together as a system and working closely with our partners in the care sector to avoid COVID-19 getting back into our, in, into our care homes in particular. So that was just a, a quick canter through. I'm happy to kind of open it up to questions and also uh, perhaps I don't know if Matt or Vicky want to add anything at this point in time. They've obviously uh, worked very closely with us as part of the outbreak management plan arrangements. Thanks, Tom. Can I invite Matt to work to add anything? Sorry, Matty. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, I think we've, we've talked about this a bit in the health wellbeing board yesterday, which is also broadcast live. So I think it's worth reflecting in the next item we're going to talk about winter planning and flu planning is some of the challenges that we're facing in the NHS with this second wave of COVID. So um, if you look back in March and April, um, patient behaviour was quite different, I think, to what it is now. So people were actively um, perhaps holding off seeing the GP. We were seeing far less routine care coming through our hospitals. Our a &E attendances were far lower than they are now. So as we approach the second wave, I think we do face a challenge in that our general practices are very busy, our community services are very busy and our hospitals are very busy. So we don't have the same flexibility that we had previously. And we have sadly seen a rise in COVID cases in, in South Tyneside Hospital. Uh, and that's replicated across the northeast. So I think it's really important that the governing body is aware that there's a, a real challenge facing us there and we will work through that together as partners. But um, that will be very much dependent on us working with the, the public and, and helping them to have clear messaging about what we're asking them to do. Thanks, Matt. Anything from, uh, from your perspective to add, Vicky? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what Matt said in terms of those system pressures and we will work collaboratively to try and manage those um, because obviously it, it plays out across all the partners in the system. Um, we'll probably come on to it further in the winter planning, but obviously the winter plan 
for adult social care has just been published and there's four key areas within that and, and uh, infection control is one of them. As Tom said, we are working with all of our care homes to manage the risk of infection within the care homes and how we provide support to those care homes as, um, as a local system and working collaboratively with our partners. We are really mindful of the impact of um, restricting care home visits because you know, whilst it does prevent or try to prevent the risk of infection into the homes, we're really mindful of the impact in terms of well-being to the residents and the impact of families. So we will keep that under regular review. And I think it's just worth noting that. Thanks. That's all. It's certainly a, a very concerning picture, I think, um, particularly the uh, what seems to be the spread in the, the last few weeks to uh, to the older age groups um, and that we're now starting to see, as you said, um, uh, increased hospital admissions and sadly deaths from, from COVID-19. So it does give us uh, as great concern and um, this is something that as part of the COVID leadership board, I know that the uh, that we're, we're, we're looking at on a, a weekly basis as the, uh, as the, the leaders of the partnership uh, locally. Uh, so can I just ask any other governing body members to uh, to ask any questions or make any comments on that? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, for that report, Tom. It was very useful. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things that I'm hearing is the um, the messages that go out and the importance of making sure that we're very clear in the messages in terms of what we need people to be doing. Um, so it's good to hear and get some assurance that that's being done um, on a partnership level. Yeah. Thanks for that. It is, it is important and uh, it is more difficult, isn't it, at isn't this stage trying to uh, keep the economy uh, going as, as far as possible um, while still protecting health. It's uh, a very, very difficult line and uh, very difficult to do both of those things and create clear messaging. So. Uh, it really is a tightrope for, uh, for the entire country, I think, at the moment. Okay. Can we move on? Can we uh, thank Tom for, for that report? Can we move on to the, the winter report? I'm aware that winter planning and, and COVID planning and, and outbreak management is sort of all merging into one. So, uh, colleagues, uh, maybe Matt, if you could lead on uh, on, on this, this winter item and, um, uh, and just ensure the governing body has, uh, has the assurance it requires. Uh, yeah, no problem, uh, Matthew. And and given the time, I'll be I'll be fairly brief in setting out where we are with winter planning, and just give a a, a brief update on where we are with the flu program, which is obviously of critical importance to us um, to us this year. So clearly, winter comes every year, so we start planning for winter, frankly, from the the end of the previous winter. So that that work is ongoing throughout the summer. Um, there was this uh, regional stress test of the winter planning arrangements yesterday. Um, which South Tyneside and Sunderland took part in, in collectively. We have our local A&E delivery board, which is meeting this afternoon um, to consider where, where the winter planning has got to. And we have surge groups that meet separately in South Tyneside and Sunderland currently on a daily basis to make sure we're managing issues uh, as they arise. I think the key challenges that face us this year are about how we manage that at the um, restart of all of the elective planned work alongside the emergency demands that come year after year with the COVID um, challenges, the infection prevention control, the space challenges. So those are the, the key things that the uh, the winter planning groups are focused on this year. And I think we've got uh, we've got really good plans. Uh, there is a particular issue about how we support our care homes as part of the system. So we've worked really hard over the last nine months to make sure our care homes have got excellent support in terms of, as Jeanette mentioned earlier, in infection prevention control, support from our joint commission unit, support from GPs, support from community services. Um, and clearly that's something that's that's really important. Vicky may wish to touch upon that as part of the adult social care winter plan in a, in a second. Um, and if I may, I'll just give a few uh, headlines from where we are with the flu programme. So we start every year in, in September. We're working on the A Better You principles this year, so looking to be proactive, personalised and, and fair. Um, and we've had a very COVID safe start with our GPs and community pharmacies, and we've made an excellent progress in September. So one practice I'm aware of is vaccinated more than 50% of their over 65s already, which is a really real achievement this early in the season. Um, another practice is reporting over a thousand people in a COVID secure way being uh, through their first Saturday clinic 
and the primary care networks are collaborating to make sure that our care home residents are, are vaccinated as soon as possible because clearly that represents a very a very vulnerable group. Um, our community pharmacies are providing excellent support, so outreach programmes into low uptake areas, traditionally low uptake areas, um, supporting the, with the Melissa bus in, and clinics in, in the mosques. Uh, and again, community pharmacies are really working hard together to make sure health and care staff have access, easy access to vaccines. So uh, Louise and, and colleagues are doing a fantastic job there. We've got, as every year, targeted programmes for preschool and school aged children for people who are shielding. Um, for pregnant women and people such as those living with addictions, long term conditions, uh, learning disabilities, and those are going well so far. Um, I think I'll probably stop at that point actually because the, so we're at the, an early point in the flu program. But I think we've seen real acceleration and partnership working this year that gives me real confidence that we'll get um, an excellent uptake in flu vaccine. And obviously with the, the challenges with COVID, that's more important than ever this year. Thank you for that, Matt. It's certainly uh, good to hear what's going on. It gives us a, a degree of confidence that although, uh, as you say, we predict a, a difficult winter with uh, with COVID uh, and uh, the uh, the backlog of work from the, the first wave of COVID, uh, that things are being uh, being tackled in a, as a proactive and partnership way as, as far as possible in South Tyneside. So that just gives me significant assurance that although it's, it's likely to be bad, we're doing everything we can to make it as as less bad, perhaps we could say, as, as, as it will be. Um, colleagues, any questions for, for Matt, uh, um, Jeanette, and then maybe if we ask Vicky to uh, to just give a, a social care update as well. So Jeanette first. Thank you. And it's it's a, um, a comment more than a question. I think it's really reassuring, uh, Ram, taking the um, A Better You principles approach because um, it's, it would be so easy to just take the low hanging fruit approach and just try to increase those numbers. But this is a this is an approach to try to re reach those people who are most likely to benefit from um, being, uh, you know, having the flu vaccine administered to them and who typically might have been the ones who haven't had it in previous years. So I just I, I just think it's worth commending that approach because it's really important. Uh, and if I may, I, I just I, I can't take credit for that. It's really Tom and colleagues in primary care, uh, Dave, Judy and Louise Lydon, our colleagues in community pharmacy. So they're doing a fantastic job. I just want to commend them all. OK, can I ask Vicky for a social care update? I think Pat after Vicky, um, if you could, uh, Pat. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. So from a social care perspective, as I alluded to earlier, the winter plan has been published. Um, and we do have to submit an assurance to the Department of Health and Social Care by the 31st of October um, in relation to what our winter plans are as a system, because there's a number of requirements um, as a system. So working collaboratively with colleagues from the CCG and the NHS in terms of what our winter plans are. There's four key areas within that winter plan. Um, in relation to workforce, working collaboratively, infection and um, prevention and control, and then system oversight and assurance. So we will be working through through that in terms of, you know, what have we got in place already? Because we do have a lot of things in place, particularly around supporting our care homes. Um, and we just need to make sure that we do have um, everything in place to support our care homes. Obviously, they're a big part of our system. Um, and, you know, they were a big part of our system in the first wave, so we need to make sure that um, we can support them in what now feels like our second spike. Um, and then um, we need to make sure if there are any gaps in terms of our winter planning, we've got robust plans in place to take us forward through what is going to be a really challenging period. In terms of social care itself, obviously, we are feeling the pressures in terms of the increased activity going through the hospitals. Um, so obviously, you know, that as the numbers increase, we feel that coming through in terms of discharges. So we're working to do what we can to support that um, and working with partners around that. Thanks, Vicky. Pat, did you want to ask a question? Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge challenge, massive challenge um, with regard to the flu vaccine. And uh, I think that's been met with a, a, a huge effort from everyone. So well done to all. I guess from my point of view, the question that, it, it, that I'd like some assurance on is that we have a robust per, uh, process for flu vaccine availability versus demand. Uh, I might ask Neil to comment on that, if that's OK. Yeah. 
So, um, uh, so I lead the um, uh, the ICS uh, flu board. Um, I think the demand for the um, flu vaccine is significantly higher than it has been in previous years, and the number of people that we are immunising in the eligibility criteria have also increased this year. Um, uh, we are um, prioritising, obviously, those who are most at risk. Um, uh, I would still encourage people uh, to to make uh, appointments. We we feel that we have got enough vaccine to vaccinate the at risk groups. The government is working with the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh, to um, uh, secure further um, orders of the um, uh, flu vaccine, um, and they will come online later on in the season. But we're in a good place. I don't know if you remember, but we did actually encourage all practices to increase their order um, of vaccines way back a good few months ago. So we're in a better position of, uh, with fac vaccine availability than a lot of other areas. Um, but as I say, demand is high. We're, we're collaborating with other um, uh, local areas um, so that we can all work together and make sure that we get um, uh, our at-risk populations um, uh, vaccinated. Um, and again, that's working collaboratively with, with, uh, with community pharmacy as, as well. So I think it will become challenging with flu vac uh, vaccine availability as we get through the season, but um, collaboration, prioritisation, and a national effort to secure um, additional flu vaccines, which will come online later in the season, is probably um, uh, the, the best response to that question. But it's a valid concern. Thank you. Thanks very much, Neil. Thanks, Pat, for the question. Before we move on, could I could I invite Tarquin just as a as a as a secondary care consultant, really at the sharp end of, of all of this, just to uh, to comment on uh, on the assurance that uh, that's been been gained here, and uh, and just check in with you, Tarquin, whether there's anything more that you feel that. Uh, the CCG needs to what it needs to do. Hi. Uh, so no, I mean I, th I think this is just going to be a massive challenge, and it's encouraging to hear that we're already slightly ahead of the game. But I think we're all taking a big deep breath and waiting to see what happens. We're as prepared as we can be uh, for the predicted problems. Um, but I think, you know, we just don't, we need to be nimble, I guess, is the, the, the phrase, you know, we need to react to what happens because it could be worse than we think. And actually it might not be as bad as we think. It's just, I'm reassured that there's lots of programs going on um, that we are vaccinating above where we were last year. And, and it's encouraging to hear that the, the number of people who want vaccinations has, has gone up because that's one of the issues that we have year on year. So the public are obviously interested and listening and we have to manage that demand. Thanks, Tarkin. I, I'm confident that the uh, the strong strong partnership working that we have within South Tyneside will enable that to that nimble response throughout winter that you say is so uh, so crucial. So uh, I think if anyone if anyone can do it, South Tyneside can do it from uh, from that point of view. So thanks thanks for that. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Vicky, uh, for those reports. Um, we'll accept the uh, the assurance given, uh, and um, we will be ready for to be nimble during winter. I think. Uh, can we move on then to the next item on the agenda, which is the, uh, the performance report? Uh, I think Matt, as is not going to be the traditional performance report, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so I'm going to put the slides up if that's helpful, just so that we can all be clear about where we're um, where we are on the uh, on the agenda set. So um, Matthew, you're the only person I can see. So I'm just checking that you can see the slides. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to run through three of these, and it really does reflect the challenges that we've had since the COVID period began earlier this year. So um, firstly, if we look at um, a &E attendances, so I'm going to look at a &E attendances in our elective care, so planned procedures and then, and then cancers. Um, so what you can see here is performance against what's called the 95% target, so the proportion of patients spending four hours or less in, in a &E. The green line represents the national target, the thick red line represents South Tyne and Sunderland Foundation Trust, and we're in the red dotted line, from March 2019 represents just South Tyneside Hospital itself. So what you can see, we've talked about this before, so I won't dwell on it, is the real challenges we had last winter with uh, a &E performance. Um, extremely difficult period for, for everybody involved. Um, and since the COVID period began in February, March, we saw a, a decrease in a and &E attendance quite dramatically in the early period of the year. 
And although those, those attendances have recovered back to normal, we have seen actually that uh, any &E performance has been really, um, really positive actually in the mid 90s throughout that period. I think what I would flag though is that as any &E intensities have now risen back to very close to where they were in, in um, this period last year, um, and with the rise of uh, COVID positive patients in South Tyne South Digital Hospital, I think we should expect that that positive performance is going to be very difficult to maintain moving forward. And I think we'll see that start to become a real strain in, in future months. Um, so I think it's really important to be aware of that. Uh, the next slide, hopefully you can see this, is um, the new uh, RTT, which is about the proportion of patients who've been waiting longer than 18 weeks for their treatment. Now you can see on this that for the last four or five years we've performed extremely well amongst the very best in the country and making sure that our patients do not wait long times for their, their planned care. But clearly what you can see in the early part of the year, January, February, is that as we started to reduce activity very dramatically to be able to focus on COVID-19 in March, April and May, um, we, we've really seen that patients have been started to wait longer and longer and that is a, a challenge that faces the, the country in its entirety. As I say, there's a a real balance to be struck now that we're really starting to to bring some of that elective care back online. Equally, we've got the challenges of the winter pressures and COVID patients. I think they're very difficult things to balance. So we have less of the flexibility for staffing that we had in March and April to use for our more COVID and emergency care. Um, but equally, we've got this challenge with, with elective care. So it, it represents a very difficult position. Um, and in terms of cancer, so the, the top chart there is patients seen within two weeks of an urgent referral for suspected cancer, and the bottom chart reflects patients treated within two months, 62 days of a referral for suspected cancer. And very sadly, this reflects the challenges that we had through that COVID period. So as we were able to see less patients, as services become less efficient because it takes longer to process people and, and to see people to treat them sensibly in a, in a COVID safe environment, it's become increasingly challenging to meet the, the, the guidelines. And in fact, the rest of the country is struggling even, even more than us. So our ability to see people quickly has been um, extremely challenging. And it is likely that although elective care has, has come back to, to some extent over the last few months, as we enter winter, we're going to see that remains increasingly challenging. Um, so I'm not going to dwell further on that, other than that, than that to say that reflects, I guess, the the, the that reflects the last two uh, agenda items we've just had really in terms of the challenges with COVID, the challenges of winter and the reality of the consequences of some of the decisions that we had to make earlier in the year to try and make sure that we limited the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, and it is going to take us a, a long time to be able to recover to get back to those levels of uh, being able to see people and treat people as quickly as we've been able to in the past so I'm afraid it does represent a very challenging position for us all. Thanks very much, Matt. Can, can I ask, do, do you have any sense, I mean, we have data up till July, do you have any sense that the uh, August, September numbers, I know this is when the the, uh, the providers have really been trying to uh, to motor through a lot of this this activity, are you getting any any early anecdotal reports as to whether this uh, this is turning uh, over that period or whether... Oh, well, uh, to do, to do so, so we will see an in improvement in the August and September positions. However, I think from September it's going to become increasingly challenging. The reality is that the um, the reduction in that planned work, elective work, um, allowed us to have flexibility to, for staff to be to to respond to the COVID challenges in that first period in March and April and May. So, if we're trying to maintain those programs of elective care, of planned care, and deal with significant numbers of COVID patients, that is a very, very challenging balance. So yes, um, we'd expect to see some recovery in August, September. I think whether that will continue to winter, I think, you know, and Tyke might reflect on this, it's going to be a very, very difficult challenge to to um, to achieve. Tarquin? Yeah, I absolutely agree that the system runs at full pelt nearly all the time and therefore we've got to keep going to keep up with demand and yet somehow regain the ground that we've lost uh, and those two things in a system under challenge is going to be really difficult. I think the other thing that really strikes me is that graph that Matt put up about the the A&E weight. Um, what we can't have in this coming winter is large numbers of people in A&E together waiting long periods of time. So controlling that demand, so the talk before you walk is going to be essential. Uh, it comes back to the point of the, you know, the, the I A&E question that actually we need to try and control those numbers because you don't want to be sitting in a waiting room or in an ambulance queue um, 
with lots of other people at this time. So that's going to be a real challenge. And that's about um, that's about forward planning and, and, and how you manage those numbers. And I'm sure Janelle wants to comment on that. Can I just just another point on that is, is the key thing. There's two key um, things to think about either in terms of that flow through any there's the number of patients who are coming through into the department and then there's the number of patients who are able to progress through either home or admitted into a bed and therefore the flow of, of patients who are inpatients out into the community to their homes to care homes and that again is going to re reflect a very challenging position for us about supporting patients who may or may have had COVID into back into other other settings and we're really going to face um we've got really good support mechanisms in place but that is going to be a challenge this winter I interrupted you I'm sorry Folks, I'm, I'm aware that we could probably talk about all of these things for a very long time, but we have got a lot of business today. So I think what we need to do is simply just uh, accept the, the, again, the assurance that the, 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 there is work ongoing to, to make this as, uh, as good as it can be uh, and, and move on to the, uh, the next item on the, uh, uh, on the agenda, if that's all right with everybody. Um, we're not going to change things by, by our discussion further, I don't feel. So can we uh, can I thank you, Matt, for, for that brief report uh, and move on to, to Kate and the finance report again. I'm aware that things are changing quite rapidly in the world of NHS finance at the moment. And Kate, this report was written at a certain point in time. Uh, we can certainly take it all as read, but uh, I think you can give us a, a brief highlights uh, and update. That would be great. Thanks, Matthew. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. This was written at a point in time and I feel like I'm constantly chasing my tail and trying to give you new information when we're just receiving it. So the report covers the period up to the end of August. Um, following the um, writing of the report, we then were given allocations up to the end of September. So we have uh, full allocations up to the end of September and we have reimbursement to the end of September. So we're quite um, risk free, I suppose, if you, if you want to describe it that way for that period. NHS EI have now, um, sorry, NHS England and Improvement have now issued um, allocations at a system level for the months through from September, uh, October through to March. And they have issued um, it in, in sort of four elements. So there's core allocations for CCGs and our provider trusts know what their block contracts are going to be. There's um, top up money to try and make sure all organisations break even. And there's funding for COVID and then there is some growth funding to, to mop up everything else essentially. And we are being asked at uh, an ICP level to, to distribute that funding across all organisations. So we're just in the process of doing that. I think I've spoken previously about a memorandum of understanding of how we're all going to work together and how we might distribute that funding. We're, we're working through those principles with the funding that is available. Um, and we are also revisiting our forecasts, I think, um, to make sure that they're as accurate as they can be and that we're also um, asking for the right amount of funding if you see what I mean. Um, naturally, we, we have to take into account the fact that we are seeing a spike with, with the COVID. And so um, what's in our forecast might change. So again, we're going to have to be nimble. We're going to have to be fluid in how we, we organise our finances going forward. So um, I think we have to accept that we, we will need to be um, supporting each other across the system financially, as well as in all other areas. Um, I can't give any more detail than that at the moment because we haven't finalised what it's going to look like. Um, I'm afraid I, that's all I can tell you at the moment. Thanks, thanks very much, Kate. Um, colleagues, any questions or comments? I'm looking particular to uh, to John from uh, from the audit committee uh, point of view, as I always do at this point. No, I think um, Kate, as ever, summed it up uh, accurately. There's nothing to add. It's been a difficult period and we've got to get through the next bit on the uh, system level allocations to understand where the CCG will be at the end of the year. Um, same for everybody at the moment. Uh, Neil, do you want to come up there? Yeah, just very quickly to remind governing body members that we are working through some of the detail and we're planning a potentially governing body and common session on the 29th. Um, where there'll be much more, uh, hopefully we'll have more detail and uh, be able to present a system plan for getting us through the next six months. Thanks for that. So if we can just take the uh, the information report uh, as, uh, as received uh, and move us on to the, uh, the next item on the agenda. Uh, so this uh, next item, I believe, is the, uh, the end of life item. Um, I note that uh, Nusha Ali has uh, has joined the uh, the call for uh, for this. So in a moment, I'll ask Nusha just to uh, to, to introduce herself. 
Colleagues, uh, I'm aware that we are a little behind time. I, I am going to allow this meeting to overrun into the time we have allowed for the, uh, the AGM, uh, which was to, to immediately follow this meeting. Uh, if this uh, if this uh, this item requires uh, more detailed discussion, so just to flag, please don't feel under any any time pressures to uh, to go through and uh, and get this uh, this item done. We need to make sure we uh, we give it full and proper consideration. So um, yeah, Nusha, if I could ask you to uh, to, uh, to to introduce yourself briefly, um, and then I'll hand over to uh, to Matt Brown. To, uh, to, to introduce the paper, I think, uh, before we come back to you, Nusha. So, Nusha. Nusha, I can't hear you there. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Nusha Ali. I'm um, one of the clinical directors at South Times ICCG, and I've just started this month. Um, but before that, I was um, end of life clinical lead at the CCG um, for about five years. So, um, sort of, I'm familiar with the um, with uh, with the topic, and I think I'm going to describe the model. Is that right now, Matt? So maybe we'll let Matt introduce the, uh, okay, the sure. paper, and then we'll hand over to you to uh, to describe the model a little later on. So, Matt, over to you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so the paper you've got in front of you, we're asking the governing body to make a decision today. So we're asking you to um, support and endorse this model so we can move forward and implement what we think will be a really exciting model for the people of South Tyneside and a real improvement um, in end of life care. Uh, so I'm going to set a little bit of context um, and I'm going to talk through a briefly some of the points in the paper and then I'll hand over to, um, to Nusha, to Dr Ali, who I'm sure wants to um, set out some more depth. We have covered one or two of the um, points I was going to make in some of the questions earlier, but I think there is a key start point here, which was the insolvency of St Clair's, that independent hospice, in January 2019. Um, and, and as I've mentioned earlier, that was a big blow to everyone in South Tyneside, to ourselves, our clinicians, and to all the people who've, who've used and benefited and supported that service over the last 30 years. I think people have put a huge amount of effort and, and their own money into that, that facility, so it was a, an enormous blow. But we have to deal now with the, the reality that St Clair's isn't uh, an entity anymore, it doesn't exist. And since January 2019, we've had no hospice and no end of life beds in South Tyneside, no dedicated end of life beds in South Tyneside. So we under we set out to undertake um, a co-design exercise. Now, what that means is we set out with, to have a series of interviews with staff, community services, palliative care nurses, our specialist doctors, GPs, third sector, hospice colleagues, and critically patients and people who, patients and carers of people who've been through through an end of life, end of life experiences. Um, we then went through a series of in-depth focus groups to explore those experiences in more depth. And then finally, we had three large events at which all of those different partners came together to explore their findings in depth and to, to generate the model that we, um, that we have now come to. Um, there's a very detailed 150 page paper which the governing bodies received previously, which is on the CCG website, which sets out all the detail of that co-design. And I think it's really, really worth um, really worth reading. I think the main themes that came out of that were, firstly, people were really clear they wanted care to be provided at home wherever possible. And actually, um, about half of our deaths sadly take place in hospital. After that, 45% take place in patients' own homes or care homes. And about 4% took place in the hospice when that existed previously. So that was about 65 deaths in a hospice and about 750 deaths per annum uh, at home in the community. So one of the key themes that came out of that was really we need to have a very community focused, home based service. It was felt that actually without the hospice, there was a lack of choice. And so we needed some dedicated beds for respite symptom management and so on. It was felt there was limited capacity in specialist palliative care. So, for example, the need for more palliative care consultants, specialist doctors. Uh, it was felt that there was a need for support at home with um, what you might call a caring service, home care, social care, so people are really well supported through that through the last periods of life, and a need for better communication, coordination, and integration. So those those things are set out of the paper. I think the key thing is people told us actually they want to have choice at where they die, and most people say they prefer to die at home. So about eighty five percent of people tell us they prefer to die at home, but it, critically also people want to be able to have the option of example some really peaceful bedrooms should they um, should that be their choice 
Um, so in the paper, what we're proposing is a, a new model. It's not about moving services, it's about new investment in developing really good palliative care nursing, really building on what we've got in the community, so extra palliative care nursing, that really um, dedicated rapid access social care to support people at home, and an extra consultant. So we're talking about roughly doubling the amount of specialist palliative care consultant capacity we have in South Tyneside, going from 1.2 whole time equivalents to two. As I say, really building on the services that exist already. But we've also worked really hard to find a way of ensuring that we have dedicated, peaceful, dignified bedrooms in a dedicated unit in South Tyneside. Um, in Haven Court is the proposal for that. And that'll be a separate unit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later, perhaps, um, about the reason that we've gone for, for four beds. Um, but clearly those home from home beds are just part of the proposal. So what we've seen since COVID-19 is actually a big increase in, in people passing away at home with non-COVID reasons. And the community services that we've put in over the last two years have really supported that. And I'm sure Anusha will want to touch on that. Um, well, I think what it boils down to is end-of-life care is critically important. Having a good death is absolutely as important as having a good life. And that's why we've worked really hard to make sure we can have extra community services, extra capacity, and to make sure we have dedicated bedrooms in South Tyneside. There's a particular point about funding I think I need to make, which is I mentioned earlier the hospice fundraising environment is incredibly challenging and many hospices that I've talked to in the recent weeks have set out how difficult this period has been for them. So we've worked really hard to make sure we can have secure dedicated funding through the NHS. So the one and a half million pounds is that set out in the paper is NHS funding. And should actually people want to contribute as this model develops, then that would be great. I'm sure we can supplement um, the services that we're planning to put in place. But we want to start by saying we want a secure, sustainable service using NHS funding. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is that we've put some photos of the Haven Court model up on the website. So if people are watching this at home, they'll be able to have a look on the CCG website and see those to give them a, a sense of, uh, of what's available. But I think perhaps at this point I'll move on to to Nusha to talk a bit more in detail about the, the model that we're proposing. And Matthew, I'll come back to talk about things such as the bedrooms and so on um, when that's um, available. Thank you, so Nusha. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so I think it might be worth saying that um, as as when I was um, a GP registrar, I worked in a hospice for six months full time. And um, I remember thinking, this is great, but clearly not everybody ends their life in a hospice. And thinking at that point, um, communities as important um, and it's one part of quite a big system and as working as a GP since then I've seen how um, how capable and passionate and hardworking our community teams are um, but when the hospice did shut and um, it did leave a gap in the sort of provision that you would want for complex medical situations such as people being in a lot of pain and requiring a lot of extra medications or in a lot of psychological distress so I'm really pleased that now we've got these four beds, bedrooms in Haven Court, and should people need that access to staff um, 24, um, 24 hours a day. But I'm also really pleased that um, we were able to increase the amount of community support that um, that is provided to people. So when the when St Clair shut at the beginning of 2019, we um, we asked our teams, what can we do in the meantime? And the view was, let's let's make um, a dedicated community service day day and night. The night time already existed, but to the to have a very quick response to people's needs during the day, and and that's what they've done. Um, and the night services continue. So now in in the community, it is 24 hours a day as well. We also set up a, um, an overnight pharmacy um, service so that people can easily access medications in the middle of the night if they, if they are needed um, more urgently. Um, it's also worth, worth mentioning the third sector, how we see that working eventually, which is that they would be working out of Haven Court and providing that support because we've got excellent sort of third sector um, teams in, in, in South Tyneside and obviously we're really keen to have them as part of the wider um, they're, they're a vital part um, of the system. And lastly, I just wanted to mention the caring service element. So when, again, through the co-design, people, sort of the health professionals that look, at, look after people with palliative care needs had said, we need a sort of a, a standard of caring 
um, to support us and um, do the work that we need to do. And I'm really pleased that as part of this model, we've we've addressed that so that um, it will be a, um, a, a certain level and it will have that reliability to it. Um, bef this will be alongside the Marie Curie services, which have um, been running for a while now um, in the locality, which provide overnight services um, to support, again, to support the community teams. Um, I guess the last thing that I just wanted to mention, though, was that I know there's been a lot of focus on where the beds will be, but for me as a GP, what's more most important that people get the right level of care delivered to them in a peaceful environment. And regarding bed numbers, again, I think it's important to say I would prefer to have on paper a, a lower number of beds, but to have that those beds be really responsive. So as a GP, being able to get um, a patient in when they need to and um, if it's that day then if the capacity is there to 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 be able to respond to that rather than have sort of a higher number of beds on paper but perhaps not have those beds used as as efficiently um, as they could be so that's um over, back over to you Matthew I think okay uh, Matt do you want to so, um Take us, Matt, take us further to, through the, the paper, or do you want to pause I, for questions at this point from members of the governing body? I suppose, I, I think I just want to, because we had a lot of questions from the public about the bed numbers, so I think I'll just pause on that for a second if I may, um, and then I, I think we're perhaps open to questions. So there's a few things that we need to recognise. I know I've said this a couple of times today, but I think it's really important to recognise there are no dedicated end life beds in South Tyneside as it stands. So it's not about moving beds around, it's about saying why, what are we going to introduce, what we're going to put in. Um, obviously that was just different two years ago, but that's that's where we are. So we've, we've got to have a, I guess, work out what we think is a good start point. So if you look back at St Clair's, in the last three years it was open, it had eight beds, but its bed occupancy was 51%. So overall it used about four beds. Um, we also know that we can make sure we can secure the resources and the workforce for four beds. Um, and the, I guess the third thing about this is we don't really know what the impact of COVID will be on patient behaviour. So it's really challenging to be absolutely categorical about exactly what choices people will make on, under what circumstances. So what we've said is we're going to introduce these four beds, assuming the governing body supports proposal in Haven Court. And then once that's running, once that gets starting, we'll have another look at it and we'll see how it's working. So actually, if we need to adjust that over time, that's something we can we can work at. But at the minute, there isn't anything. We've got to start somewhere and work out where we're going for the future. So I guess that was what I want to say about the, the bed numbers in particular. Okay, thanks for that, uh, that clarification, Matt. Can I ask uh, anybody members for, uh, to ask any questions on the uh, proposed model? And so, Jeanette, you have your hand up there. Yes, um, I think the um, the point that uh, Nusha made about the investment in community services across the board, not just community nursing services, but also the pharmacy services, re we really need to acknowledge that um, because there was gaps. And we so when we talk about the number of beds, um, we have to take into account that we've significantly improved the services available to people in the community um, and when, when there's more access to a palliative care consultant um, the, the aim of that um, I'm presuming and I'll, I'll stand to be corrected but is to support the community team so that they can keep people at home as much as possible with advice and support but I suppose the question is and I'll ask this on behalf of um, you know all, lots of, of the questions that have come through. How will the model be modified as we go forward? Because we are doing our best, um, and I, I am in support of, of the model that's been proposed. We're doing our best to put in place what we believe is the right, um, you know, number of beds, etc., the right level of services. But what process will we have to monitor feedback? from people using the services, particularly when, um, presuming we go ahead with it, when we open the beds, but also if if demand changes, how are we going to monitor that? Perhaps if I start and then Nisha might want to come out on that. So I think you raise a really important point, Jeanette, which is that is we need to make sure that we really understand the impact of 
the impact of the changes and the experience of our patients, of our residents, of our staff, those patients who obviously work there and those patients referring to the services. So um, we'll obviously make sure the governing body has regular reporting. The Quality Patient Safety Committee, I'm sure, will have a very strong interest in having regular report on a series of indicators that we, we've set out in the quality impact assessment. So I think we'll have a really strong and robust mechanism for making sure we assess the quality. And obviously it's a slightly different arrangement to what we had previously, but that will be a key part of it. I don't know whether Nusha wants to add to that, but we will need to continue to work through the model with our local clinical teams, with patients and with stakeholders in social care in the third sector. Because these things are these things do evolve over time, don't they? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Just to follow on, Jeanette, uh, we do um, have the Palliative Care Alliance. So um, whilst there'll be formal ways of, of receiving feedback, I guess we do already have an, an alliance in South Tyneside where various people who are involved in, in end of life and palliative care come and we meet once once every four to six weeks. And that's the sort of place we can have these discussions. So if people feeling like there's a lot of pressure in one area of the system, that's the place that we talk about it and we try and um, figure out the solutions. So it, that, that process is already regularly there. Okay, thank you, Nisha and Matt. Um, Tarquin, were you uh, want to ask a question as well? It was really just a, a comment that as a, as a hospital consultant, and particularly as a geriatrician, I look after large numbers of people who are in the final year of their life and a significant proportion in the final days to hours of their life. And if you talk to them, uh, the overwhelming proportion express a preference to be at home when they die. So uh, some of the questions on the, the emails were concerns about how do we know what people's wishes are? And actually the, the co-design process um, gave us information about what people's wishes were in South Tyneside, but that's absolutely backed up by my experience as a doctor in a hospital, but also by the medical literature, which is overwhelmingly in support of the fact that most people want to die at home. Um, but also things like the, the, you know, the Voices Survey, the national audits that that support that as well, and other reports from from um, charitable sectors like the, you know, Macmillan and um, and their sports. They suggest that three quarters to, you know, 75 to 80 to 80 percent of people actually want to die at home. So this is absolutely the right thing to do to move away from a traditional model where we've got beds more beds to a new model, which is the, the the right direction to support people's wishes so that we increase community services to allow people to be at home if they want to be there. And I think that's really important as well that this paper is entitled the best possible care, whatever your preference. So we're not saying you can't be in a bed when you die, but we're actually saying if you want to be at home, how do we meet people's wishes? And, and as a, again, as a hospital doctor, there's nothing more frustrating than listening to people who want, who are in hospital and want to be at home when they die and not having the community resource to support them out of hours as well as within hours. So, and, and the other frustrating thing is when people are at home in their final stages and hit a crisis that could be managed in the community, whether that's pain or other symptom control. And if you haven't got those community services there, the default is that these people end up in hospital and that's not what they want. So I, I absolutely support this. I think it's the right direction of travel that we move away from all beds to some beds and much more in the community. Um, and yeah, that's what I think. Thank you, Tarkin. That's very, uh, very reassuring comments that uh, uh, that you're providing for us. Uh, Vicky, did you want to comment there? Yeah, I would, thank you, Matthew. So just to pick up on Tarquin's point there, I think it is about having a robust model in the community. Um, certainly from an adult social care perspective, that's what we're hearing from people. They do want to be supported within their own homes, within their local communities. And we're certainly developing models um, to do that. But it, it's about having a collective system system response to be able to do that and give people the choice um, and picking up on Matt's point about we don't know how COVID will change people's behaviours so we, we're certainly seeing you know changes in terms of um, people's behaviours around not necessarily wanting to be within care homes so less numbers within our care homes and more people wanting to wanting support at home so I think it is about having a really robust model where people have the, the choice and the preference and not necessarily having that default position of ending up in hospital. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, I'm aware, Jeanette, I know you've got your hand up there. I'm just going to, to, to take Chair's prerogative and, and ask a question about the, uh, 
the actual environment of, uh, of Haven Court itself, because there, there has been a lot of concern from the, uh, the, the questions raised by the public about the detail of, uh, of the suitability of the environment. I know we've mentioned um, the bedrooms being private, being en suite. Um, can you give us a bit more detail, either Matt or Nusha, on some of the, the facilities for, for relatives uh, that might uh, that will be will be planned, um, and a, a little bit about the, uh, the the use of the garden and the proximity to the dementia unit, and, and hopefully it allays some of the concerns raised by members of the public, uh, if you're able to, uh, on, on some of those issues. Uh, I don't know who wants to, to best respond, maybe Matt on that. Okay, perhaps if I kick off, and I'm sure Nusha will want to um, to, to add to, to, to this, but um, so what we're talking about is is um, separating a unit in, in Haven Court. So you've got those four ensuite bedrooms uh, with a family and carers room that's part of that part of that facility um, with a separate entrance. It's got dedicated car parking um, and the garden itself is distinct from the there's a distinct garden for the dementia unit. So they are they are separate. Um, I, I do think that we should say, though, that increasingly dementia will become one of the leading sources of of mortality if it is in fact it's already one of if the uh, leading source of mortality so um we, we will need to make sure that we're clear about that moving forward we can't just say this this unit must exclude dementia patients i think that would be an entirely wrong thing to do um but there will be distinct facilities for the two different elements now should you want to add to that i mean just to say that um from a sort of health professional point of view, obviously the, the the settings are really important, the aesthetic, the feel, the peacefulness of it, but I'm also really happy that we've got the right staff who are there, who can give that reassuring, sort of um, reassuring, caring approach and make people feel safe there. Okay, that's, that's helpful. I, I think it is an important point, isn't it, Matt, that uh, you know, over the last uh, the last 10 to 20 years we've seen uh, more and more progress on on cancer becoming some cancers becoming more curable and more fixable fewer people um, dying as a result of their cancers um, and we've seen dementia remain stubbornly unfixable uh, and we've seen more and more people uh, in the population dying as a result or with dementia um, so it is really important that actually we think ahead 10 to 20 years now uh, and think that it's going to be a, a not necessarily a bad thing but probably a very good thing that our expertise in looking after people at the end of their lives is co-located with the, uh, the unit dedicated to looking after people with uh, with dementia in the borough. I think that's a really important uh, point for, for the governing body when thinking as far ahead as we need to in these, uh, these strategic decisions. Um, Jeanette, I know you were, were waving at me before trying to come in. Is, is there something further that you, you need to, to add? It was picking up on uh, Tarquin's um, comment around people um, in the community ending up admitted to hospital in the last days or hours because of symptom control. But then Nusha's actually um, sort of stolen my thunder a bit by talking about uh, staff with the right skills because I was going to make the point that if you have staff both in the community and in this unit who have got the right skills but key to that is that they've got responsive timely support when needed because that's the critical point here if something changes and somebody's in crisis and it's distressing for the patient and the relatives they want that dealt with straight away they don't want to wait so many hours even so what's absolutely cr critical to this is that the response is t uh, timely enough it's urgent and able to deal with these crises as they occur because people feeling safe and secure and confident that that type of response is in place is key to them being able to have a, a, a sort of a good death at home or, or wherever their place, preferred place of care is. So perhaps it's important then to, to, to assure ourselves that the proposed staffing model is adequate to give that uh, that timely response to uh, to people's needs within within this unit. I don't know whether uh, Matt or probably Lucia I would, would have thought want to uh, to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. We think it is, and it's it's a 
that, that that was the purpose of the staffing model to develop exactly that responsive timely care when when patients need it so yeah absolutely uh, and just make a brief, brief aside that um we, you talked about the environment there are of course some photos that we put on the website there which show some of the bedrooms the, the garden facilities actually so hopefully that will be helpful to people members of the public who might be watching this if they want to have a look on the CSG website so to put to note, we've discussed so far the proposed environment, the proposed staffing, um, the proposed uh, the proposed model. We haven't discussed the uh, the financing uh, of the proposed model, which is a key uh, key element of uh, of making sure this is affordable and sustainable going forwards. So, uh, who's best to uh, to comment on that? Matt, do you want to comment, and maybe Kate could uh, could put out. Yeah, I mean, I've touched on this a little bit. I mean, so we've taken a decision that given the real challenges that there are for the, the hospice sector with charitable fundraising in the minute, that actually we need to look at uh, NHS funding. Um, and that's obviously much more sustainable, but it sets a, a series of parameters for, we, for which we have to work within. Um, so the paper sets out 1.5 million. We previously um, spent £800,000 at St Clair, so the additionality is about £700,000. £700, I'm sure Kate will want to to talk a little bit about that. Thanks Matt, yes, um, and I think the paper also sets out the fact that um, we are <laughs> we are living in a, a financial framework that's uncertain at the moment. So um, we've talked just previously that we're, we're trying to work through um, what's needed for this year, let alone next year. So we will have to make this decision recognising that uncertainty. Um, what I would also say though is that within the CCG's resources, we never can commit 100% of our resource recurrently each year we always keep some non-recurrently to manage any fluctuation in budget so that's the that's the element of our allocation that i would propose to use to manage um this investment if we agree that it's necessary um this year potentially next year as well until we have some certainty around those finances but there, there is non-recurrent funding available that would be be used for this investment so we're confident that uh, there won't be the funding issues that St Clair's had going forward with this, uh, this the funding from the CCG. Effectively, that's that. I think that's what uh, what people need to uh, need to know. Okay, uh, I'm going to invite those who uh, who haven't asked uh, asked questions or spoken just so that all all government body members have had a chance to uh, uh, to contribute to this. So I'm going to ask. Uh, Pat, and then John, and then Louise, uh, and then finally Neil to uh, to, to to add their uh, their voice uh, to uh, to this. Uh, so, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a lot of the questions that I was going to ask has been answered actually, um, and that was sort of around the number of beds, uh, the monitoring of such, uh, the code design process translating into the model design, particularly the engagement that we've assurance that we've um, listened and learned um, and that it has been inclusive, the environment of the bedded area and the financial risk and the funding and in particular the sort of availability of uh, numbers of staff with the right skills. One of the things that we haven't um, touched on at all and I know it was in some of the questions that was uh, raised was around the sort of the complementary therapies etc um, that was available at the hospice and I just wondered if um, anybody could just talk me through that please give us a bit of assurance in terms of how we'll do deal with those going forward. So, so perhaps again if I start and then Nisha might want to, to comment so uh, there's some things that the NHS isn't allowed to fund out isn't there so um, what we've got to do with this I could start off with them um, start off with the model we're proposing and develop the daycare and the bereavement support around it and then gradually we'll see whether we can develop that some of the additional charitable fundraising which would supplement the things the NHS is not allowed to fund such as some of those complementary therapies. I don't know whether Nusha wants to add to that. Um, just to say we recognise how important that that side of things um, is um, and that it's not just about doctors, nurses, carers, that, that sort of complementary therapy, bereavement services um, is really important. We, we It doesn't need to be, I would envisage it being part of the day services that we develop. Um, of course, this it's already going on as anyway with Cancer Connections and Age UK and various other partners um, working in, in the locality. Thank you. 
colleagues. Um, well, that answers your, your questions, Pat. Um, John, do you have any further questions or comments to make? No, just my, my only comment would be in my time with the CCG would be the thoroughness of the debate and the diligence that the officers have applied to it uh, and the probity. And, you know, I've listened to the comments of the dedicated professionals uh, and they all support this direction of travel. So from a governance and probity point of view, I'm quite clear that uh, there's been an appropriate debate within the CCG about the way forward. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Louise, would you like to, uh, to add your voice? Yes, um, it was just along the lines of Pat's comments, really. Um, obviously, there's a lot of community passion and support for end-of-life beds in South Tyneside. So I would like to ask, please, how will the CCG further engage with community groups and residents and work together to support getting the best possible holistic and complementary therapies with support from South Tyneside residents and businesses um, we will be able to still accept fundraising donations and enable an enhanced care package um, at this at this proposed site, please, because those therapies are very important in addition to the medical care. Yeah, so, so as Nusha said, some of those things exist already. Uh, as we get this model up and running, then we absolutely expect that, that we'll be able to develop those things. Some of those things require uh, separate charitable fundraising because they can't be provided by the NHS. And obviously we'd be looking to work with community groups to, to to support that. I think there's been an enormous groundswell of public um, input into into this. You know, we had many emails over the last few weeks with people expressing their perspectives on this. So I think we really want to, to build on that and work with those people moving forward. And I think we've got some thinking to do about exactly how we do that and how we help um, create that sense of, of um, of togetherness about creating a new model for the future. And so certainly working with, so it's a shame that Paul Koskin's not here because we've had some conversation about how we um, build that into some of the existing forums we have. We have we had a Let's Talk event on dying last year, last year which was really successful. We've got a good reference group. So I think, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, Louise, but other than we're committed to trying and find a way of, of channeling all that positive support uh, into, the, into the way we work. Thanks. Thanks very much. I think that's really important going forward. And I think it's it's really important to note, given that a lot of the uh, the questions we received from members of the public were on, on really quite detailed operational issues. Um, it's important to know that at this stage, what we're doing uh, and what's been asked of the governing body is to approve and endorse the model in order that we can then mobilise and, uh, and get down to some of those real brass tacks, how will it work, day in, day out questions. Um, you know, we're, we're not in a point to be able to answer all of those questions at this stage um, because of the, uh, the, the, the stage we are at in the development of, uh, of, of this. Is that perhaps important to, uh, to know for people at this stage, Matt? Yeah, I, I think it is. And I, I, I stress the point about this is new. So we we want to start here and see where it goes. We want to actually get a sense about how it's working for people. Does the capacity work? Do we need to look at different um, different bed arrangements? How, you know, how's it going? So uh, we absolutely want to do that and we'll flex the model as we as we need to move forward. But um, this really decision is hopefully to allow Nusha and the teams to really work through those all those, those nutty details and, and to help us get a really good model up and running. And although it's not uh, reflected in the, the ask of the governing body in the paper, is there uh, an implicit ask to um, uh, for the governing body to delegate to, uh, for example, the executive committee to make some of those uh, those decisions, or is that something the Palliative Care Alliance would like to uh, to have um, delegate authorities to make some of those operational decisions? I mean, what, how, how are those how are those questions going to be answered in the future? Matt? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things, I think. So firstly, in terms of the real practicalities of it, the Palliative Care Alliance is the key is the key forum for getting all the right professionals together to work through the detail of the model and expect the exec committee to have oversight of that. Um, I think given the huge public interest in this, we'd really want to make sure the governing body is really, really well informed about exactly how that's progressing, um, any issues that are arising. Um, so Certainly, I would expect that we are reporting regularly back into the to governing body. I'm, I'm really comfortable with the um, the frequency of that. I, mean, I would certainly suggest that we come back in November to talk about um, what would the timescales would be in terms of the recruitment, the work that's undertake that's needed to put this in, um, and how we're progressing. Um, we should be well on by then. So 
Um, I'll certainly start with that. Thank you. Can I then finally ask Neil for any uh, any additional comments you want to uh, to make at this stage, having listened to uh, all the debate uh, so far? Yes, thanks, Matthew. So, I mean, I joined the CCG um, at uh, the end of March, beginning of April, a very odd time when COVID was just taking off. And I asked members um, of the CCG what was the number one priority to try and sort out um, through, you know, alongside COVID. And unanimously, this was the issue that needed to be resolved. Everyone's worked very hard. I'm really impressed at the amount of engagement that has gone on. Um, uh, and I, I honestly think this is a good news story for patients who have um, uh, who have palliative care needs. And I think um, uh, the uh, this model will probably be the envy of a few other areas that I look after. And I think they will start to look towards uh, this kind of enhanced community support. So I congratulate the team for coming forward with this model. I know it's got um, uh, some concerns, but I think we just continue the conversation, don't we, and get the best deal for patients. So, um, uh, so I wholeheartedly support this approach. Thanks very much, and thanks, colleagues, for uh, for the discussion uh, around this. I think we've given this uh, thorough thorough consideration, thorough scrutiny that uh, that it deserves. I haven't heard anybody uh, wishing to. Um, wishing to uh, to not formally approve and endorse the model from the organisation. So I think we can take that uh, this discussion as the governing body's formal approval and endorsement of the model for mobilisation, um, which I think it will enable us to deliver an effective, high quality, palliative and end of life care service for South Tyneside. Uh, we take the, um, we hand over now the, uh, the responsibility to the, uh, the Palliative Care Alliance to work through some of the, uh, the detail around that mobilisation and the oversight of the uh, CCG Exec Committee and increasingly the uh, uh, Alliance Business Group, I would imagine as well, because of the, uh, the interconnections with, uh, with with partners around that. Uh, Matt may want to give some further thought on exactly how those reporting um, lines of, uh, of accountability may may work. Um, but the governing body, I think, would, is requesting the, the as you've said, Matt, regular updates uh, on the progress of this. Um, given the, uh, the level of, of interest going forwards, um, everybody happy uh, with that? Look like you're about to say something, Matt. So just just briefly, I think I just wanted to touch on the questions that we had. So we we I think we've covered actually a lot of the the net, the substance of many of the questions we've had from from members of the public, from councillors, from, from from a range of parties. Um, but we will be going back through the questions we've had to make sure we write back to people with where we've got specific questions to try and answer them as best we can if if we don't if the people don't feel that we've covered them sufficiently here so i just wanted to make that assurance to people yeah i think that's important given the, uh, the level of interest and engagement that's been that we do work to trouble to work to write to people who've asked us specific questions that we haven't covered uh, and uh, and give them specific answers so thank you for for that Matt. Okay, thank you colleagues. Um, let us move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda was uh, the Public Health and Health and Wellbeing Report, uh, which Tom uh, mentioned briefly earlier, was not much more than COVID from a public health perspective. You now Vicky's talked about winter planning already. Vicky, can I just double check in with you if there's anything further that needs to be mentioned on that subject? No, nothing else from me. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, that's great. In that case, we'll uh, we'll move on to the next item, uh, which is the government's item, the reappointment of members to the governing body. Now, I'll note that uh, Dr. Cross, you have a material interest in this, so uh, can I ask you to uh, to leave the conversation at this point? Uh, if you then uh, attempt to rejoin, and I will admit you from the waiting room uh, as soon as um, as soon as that's uh, appropriate. Uh, I obviously am mentioned in this uh, this paper, but I've had a discussion with um, uh, Pat Hall as uh, a remuneration committee uh, perspective, uh, and Pat's content that although I mentioned the decision on my reappointment is not uh, in fact made by the governing body, but it's made by the, um, uh, the council of practices, so Pat's content, uh, and I'm content to continue to chair for this item. Um, I would have excluded Paul Cuskin at this point, um, but obviously Paul sent his apologies anyway for this meeting. So, um, having gone through that preamble, can I hand over to Keith Haynes to uh, briefly introduce the paper 
Uh, again, we are pushed for time, we're over time. In fact, so keep, keep things as brief as you can. So, yeah, thank you very much. They'll be uh, very brief indeed. It, it is simply to note the approval of the Council of Practices to the recommendation of the governing body that the chair be reappointed for a further term to the 31st of March 2022. Uh, and that subsequently the remuneration can be met to consider the appointments, reappointments of Dr. Cross as secondary care doctor and make a recommendation to you as the governing body that uh, Dr. Cross be reappointed for a period expiring on the 31st of March 2022. But finally, we actually reappoint for a further three year term because uh, Paul still has, Paul Caskin still has a, a second three year term available to him that in fact Paul Caskin be reappointed as a governing as a governing body lay member for a further three year term up to the 31st of March 2024. So the recommendations sort of speak for themselves. They've been through all the appropriate uh, mechanism. Thank you, Keith. Colleagues, can I just check that everybody's happy to uh, announce the recommendations made and um, any comments people may wish to make? Pat, whether you wanted to come in there? I did. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just as, as Chair of the uh, Remuneration Committee, I think it's um, um, important that I, I do uh, stress that we, as a committee, certainly went through the uh, rob robust process in the, our recommendations, which did, in fact, include um, confirming sat satisfactory performance by the three individuals concerned. Thank you, Pat. So noting that, if we can uh, take the lack of uh, dissent as uh, as agreement to to reappoint those individuals, then that's uh, that's fantastic. Right. I will invite Dr. Cross back into the conversation, and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which I believe is mapping the risk report. That my screen has just closed itself. Yes, indeed, that is mapping the risk register. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I won't go through this in um, in great detail. So this the this is the quarterly um, update to the governing body on extreme high and moderate risks, and they reported back to the audit and risk committee. Um, I think two weeks ago on the on the same paper. So what you'll see if I just take you briefly through the the pack is that on page three of the report, which is page ninety nine zero of the pack overall. That sets out some of the um, closed and new risks that exist. So there's risk closed relating to some issues with um, Meditech and um, a newer risk opened about, again, a Meditech issue, but also some issues we have with, with the designate, designated doctor status. Jeanette may wish to comment on those, although we have picked those up in the audit and risk um, committee. And just to say the highest risks that exist really relate to COVID um, still. Obviously, that's the, the biggest challenge that faces all of us, impact on every aspect of our, of our work. So I would perhaps just um, open up to questions rather than going through it in depth, if that's OK. Thanks, uh, thanks Matt. I'm keen that we don't redo the work of the, uh, the Audit and Risk Committee here uh, and reconsider things that have been, uh, been raised. Jeanette, do you want to come in specifically with anything further? So in, in relation to the Risk 2381 and the designated doctor posts, it's just a brief update that the designated doctor um, who was off has now returned to work. He's on a phased return, but the next update will show an improved position on that risk. But at the time that this was updated, he hadn't returned. It was just a very <laughs> Sorry, muting myself by mistake instead of unmuting. Um, thanks for that. And uh, John, uh, again, as chair of the Audit and Risk Committee, uh, obviously you're close to the work, the uh, more detailed scrutiny of the risk register. Anything that you want to add or comment on? No, uh, taking your point that we don't wish to revisit the work of the Audit Committee, there was a couple of things about sort of risk possibly being ne uh, needing to be reviewed um, in the light of the heavy emphasis on COVID, but Matt agreed to take that away with uh, Kate to have a look at. Thanks very much. So we'll note the, uh, the position and the, uh, the assurance provided by the report. Thanks very much, Matt. Okay, let's move on. The next item on the agenda is, uh, I think, Neil and the collective promise to Black, Asian and minority ethnic colleagues and communities. Yes, thanks, Matthew. Um, uh, I think this is a real positive piece of work to come out of the ICS. 
Um, uh, it, obviously, um, uh, there's been um, uh, much greater emphasis um, with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, and I think it was it's timely for us as as communities and NHS organisations to think about um, our Black, Asian um, and minority ethnic communities. And are we actually um, uh, doing all we can um, to um, uh, make sure that um, there is equal opportunity and there is not any unconscious bias in either the way in which we are organised or the services that we commission. Um, uh, Yvonne Ormston, who is the um, uh, Chief Executive of Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead, has led this piece of work across the ICS so that all NHS organisations within the ICS sign up to a collective promise um, of things that we will um, actively pursue and um, look to implement, which are um, outlined in the um, uh, collective promise. I don't intend to go through that line by line. Um, I don't think there's a great deal in there that we would um, uh, want to disagree with. Um, I think it's really important that maybe we think about taking this away and how do we actually make it real and operationalise it rather than it being a document that we have and sign and um, don't actually follow up on. I think um, uh, it's, it's an exceptionally um, uh, important um, uh, collection of uh, principles um, and it's really come here to get your um, formal agreement um, and sign up to these um, so that we can then look to, as a governing body, we can maybe discuss it in one of our development sessions about how we take these principles and make them real for our organisation and the services we commission. Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions on that. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, Kate? Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Neil. I think that the key for us is, is how we make this real, isn't it? How do we just not just not sign off a piece of paper and I, I've noticed um, certainly North East Ambulance Service are doing an awful lot of work in this area at the moment so we might want to link in with them mm -hmm. and just get some of their learning. Yep, yeah, sure. I mean across the ICS though there are lots of um, uh, parts of good practice. Now as an organisation we're quite small um, so I think um, uh, you know we need to think about ourselves as part of the wider NHS and how do we link in to maybe some areas of really good practice in some of the larger organisations um, and I think that's maybe how we could look to to contribute to this important agenda but it needs some thought. Yeah I, sorry just to come back I think what one of the things I thought was really interesting was their executive team are, are reading books about gaining perspective of different um, people's how they how they experience life when you you're not familiar with it and it's just i think that was really interesting yeah i think kate you're just giving yourself the job of being the lead of uh, of make sure we implement this going forward with uh, with your, your keenness there so uh, i think we're all happy to uh, to endorse the paper but agree with the comment that we need to make sure we ensure it's not a piece of paper but is translated to real actions and uh, I look forward to, uh, to, to Kate's work in, uh, in doing that. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, we have next the, uh, the usual um, suite of uh, minutes uh, for both information uh, and from subcommittees. Um, there's also the annual report of the, uh, the Northern CCG uh, joint committee. I, I don't think that that's going to need any specific discussion unless Neil's going to wave at me. No, shake the head. Excellent. So we'll simply take those as read unless uh, anybody has any specific comments that they wish to raise. We also have the cycle of business uh, for the next uh, year, which obviously is subject to change, COVID allowing. Um, and uh, But there are things that we, we do need to get through, just for people's information, so people are aware of what's coming, and if people spot anything that needs to be added, uh, they're able to uh, to notify me and, uh, and add it. I've not been informed of any other business uh, that needs to be transacted today, uh, and I'm not really informed of any further questions from members of the public. There were one or two specific questions came in during the course of the meeting, uh, about the, uh, the the end of life um, paper, but I think we managed to cover as far as possible those questions. We will ensure that they're responded to uh, in writing, uh, as Matt said, 
uh, for, for anything that we uh, we haven't responded to. So if there's no further questions either from members of the public. In that case, it's time to me to uh, to close the formal part of the, uh, the governing body. Thank everybody for their attendance. We will be turning off the, uh, the live stream in, in a few minutes or just a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to give governing body members the opportunity to take five minutes to uh, stretch their legs, have a drink of water, uh, and we'll start our AGM, uh, which we will live stream a little later. We'll try and turn on the live stream for that at uh, 20 past 11 if possible. So governing body members, if a couple of minutes before that you're all back in your chairs, uh, that would be fantastic. So we'll see you all again.
thanks for uh, staying on the line. Those of you that have, uh, members of the public for the uh, AGM of the, uh, the CCG this year, this is a, a, an annual event uh, that uh, we go through where we uh, officially receive the, uh, the annual report uh, and the annual accounts, uh, look back over the previous year and look forward to the, uh, the coming financial year. Um, it has been a most peculiar year, hasn't it? <laughs> In terms of uh, everything seems to be going along swimmingly, um, and then boom, hit by a completely unexpected pandemic at the end of the, uh, the financial year that, uh, that that is in uh, in in under consideration today. So it, it does feel like we're talking to something, talking about something that happened almost in a previous age, doesn't it? Uh, and it may well be that people think about uh, about COVID as uh, is one of the defining uh, the defining events of uh, of our age of uh, our careers. Um, so yeah, it, it, it has been a peculiar one. Um, I don't think we'll need to introduce ourselves again. We did that at the beginning of the uh, the governing body. Thanks, uh, committee members, for attending. Uh, this has been. We'll usually have members of the public more interacting in uh, in this event. Unfortunately, we we're not able to do that due to, uh, to COVID and, and the pandemic. We did ask members of the public to uh, submit any uh, any questions uh, relating to the annual report and account in advance. We haven't had any, uh, probably because members of the public were so keen in contributing to the, uh, the discussion in the, uh, the previous meeting. Uh, we are still continuing to monitor the, um, the, the, the inbox, the email box. So if any members of the public watching on by the website want to uh, to comment or contribute by email, then we will be keeping uh, an eye on that. The annual report itself gives uh, the review of, uh, of the previous financial year. I think it's important that we uh, we do note the uh, the South Tyneside Way and the continuation of the uh, the development of South Tyneside's uh, integration, partnership working, allianced way of working, um, how that was involved in the delivery of so many of the things that we're proud of during, uh, during 1920. Uh, so a lot of the things that are in the annual report are not things that were delivered by South Tyneside CCG alone, but were delivered in partnership with others in, in, in the South Tyneside health and social care economy. I think that's the most important thing that I, that I want to uh, to point out to uh, to members of the, uh, of the governing body and to any members of the public actually. There is some highlights there. I, I do think that our continuing um, outstanding mental health rating is worth, uh, on the NHS England assurance ratings, is worth, uh, worth mentioning, worth continuing. The joint um, commissioning team has um, continued to, to be involved in much of the, uh, the mental health work. Uh, so the, the opening of the autism hub, again, uh, really key piece of, uh, of engagement work where we, we listened to what the families of, uh, of children with autism uh, about what was missing in our area uh, and we took action to uh, to open it uh, and to put something in place. Again, the, um, the, the enhanced support for the LGBT community. So we took, uh, we listened to uh, uh, to school children through the uh, the Young People's Parliament, uh, to young people of uh, uh, of the age group where they were discovering themselves. Uh, we listened to what problems they were having with their mental health, and we discovered it was uh, to a large degree due to gaps around support with their sexuality, and we put something in place. This is uh, a real, I think, uh, evidence of, of the way the CCG is working, uh, both in partnership with um, with our people, with the people of South Tyneside, and with our, our statutory partners around health and social care. So those are the two of the, uh, the key things that I want to uh, to bring out. There's an awful lot more highlights in the uh, the capital officer annual update report that Neil's going to be uh, giving. I'm not going to say anything more in the review of 1920. Well, we noted the last bit of 1920 as being the, uh, the, the, the COVID times, uh, and that obviously will, will continue through this one, which will be a large part of the work that, uh, that we do. We do statutorily need to, uh, to uh, approve the uh, accounts at this point, or bring them to the end of the meeting, so I'll hand over to Kate uh, for a note on the accounts, after, only after congratulating Kate and the team once again, as I do every year, it seems, giving us uh, a 
very smooth set of accounts uh, with no nasty surprises, with financially on balance year on year on year, and no uh, adverse audit opinions year on year on year. Just make this part of the uh, the AGM quite quick, uh, and it is no mean feat. So congratulations to KFT, uh, and if you can uh, present the accounts for us. Thanks, Matthew. You've, and thank you for those uh, kind words. You've essentially stolen all my thunder um, about the things I was going to say about the accounts this year. Um, so um, another successful year financially, um, we did um, have the opportunity to delay our closing down process uh, as a result of COVID. NHS England offered an extension, um, but working with our colleagues in the uh, Commission and Support Unit, we determined that actually we just wanted to stick to our original timeline and that worked better for our auditors as well because they had other audits booked in after us. So we stuck to the time. Okay. We did okay, can, I, can I interrupt briefly? Your camera seems to be turned off at mine. I don't know if you've done anything to it deliberately, um, but it's certainly easier to, uh, to to see if possible if you can't. Can anybody else see me? Yeah. So I, I can definitely see you, Kate. I think the rest rest of us can, Matthew. You, you seem to be losing a little bit of signal there, Matthew. I don't know whether it's the your uh, internet. <laughs> You might need to dial back in again, Matthew, because you're you're breaking up quite badly. Shall I just okay, I'll try that. I'll, I'll... I'll just continue then while you're doing that, Matthew. <laughs> Um, so yes, um, as I say, we, we stuck to the original timetable. Um, we did deliver um, a £1 million surplus at the end of the, the year. That was essentially a technical adjustment agreed with NHS England um, to move what was um, drawdown funding from our parked historic surplus between years. Um, we would have got it back this financial year, but um, the, the COVID financial regime doesn't allow that, so we would anticipate that coming back in future years. Um, as, as Matthew said, we had a, 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 an easy and a clean audit uh, and we, I think probably more importantly, um, our value for money opinion was clean as well. So the, the auditors have no concerns about our decision making in terms of value for money and how we work across South Tyneside. Um, so the, the annual report and accounts are there for you to, to see and um, happy to take questions, but they are really there. They have been to GB before, so it's really just um, for you to I don't know if you do. Do you need to approve them again? I don't think so. I think they're just there for information. We need to uh, ensure that they hopefully I, I'm not breaking up anymore. Uh, you're all appeared back on my screen, so hopefully that's, uh, that's fixed the connection. No, we just need to make sure they are available for, for public consumption at, uh, at this point, having, having previously um, been approved. OK, thanks very much, Kate. And the next item on the agenda is Neil. Uh, we've got to, a written report that uh, I hope you'll be able to uh, contribute some, some thoughts on South Tyneside CCG as it was before you joined um, and South Tyneside CCG since you've joined and going forward. So Neil, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matthew. So I've got just some brief slides. Uh, I think Kate's going to um, pop, pop them up uh, for me um, just to um, pick out some key points from the report that has been submitted. Um, uh, so, yes, um, I mean, I joined the CCG. It was meant to be the 1st of April, but with uh, when COVID hit, um, that, that was brought forward a little bit. Um, it was kind of second, third week in, in March. Um, and uh, certainly um, what I've been impressed with um, is, is actually the partnership working that um, is really well embedded within um, uh, South Tyneside CCG. It's a very stable organisation, uh, a very innovative um, uh, group of individuals who, who really are committed to delivering the best things for the population of, of, of South Tyneside. So I was just going to um, quickly run through these uh, slides. Kate, can you pop them up? I can't see them, or can you not? You're on mute. Bear with me. I'm trying to share them. For some reason, it's not. Um, OK. Doing... Well, um, I'll, 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 do, I'll, do you want me to? I've got them on my screen, if it's helpful, uh, Kate. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Matt, because it wasn't working. So if, if we just wait one second and we'll get those up. We'll just go straight to slide two, please, Matt. Is it moved on? Can you see that? It should be on slide two now. Yes. 
Uh, no, not not slide two. It's still oh, sorry, this one. <laughs> See, they're good these computers when they work, but uh, um, right, I'll just I'll just talk to them, and they'll, I'm sure it'll they'll catch up. So, um, so in 1920, I think Matthew's already um, uh, uh, mentioned uh, quite a lot of the key successes that we've picked out in the report. Um, uh, and and uh, as I say, these were before uh, before my time. Apart from obviously the COVID nineteen response, which has um, uh, I, I can say with confidence, um, both the CCG and responded incredibly well to making sure that we keep the show on the road, keep people safe um, uh, during the, uh, the the COVID pandemic. Um, the partnership working I've already mentioned, which is exceptionally strong, and the alliancing model um, uh, that South Tyneside have embedded, again, continues and continues to deliver well um, uh, for, uh, for, for, for local people. Um, the redesign of end-of-life services, it was quite clear that that was a, um, a major priority from the, uh, from the time that I joined uh, the CCG. Uh, we made a real commitment to, uh, to get on and, and, and uh, make a decision on the conversations that had, um, had gone, gone on before about the provision of palliative care services within uh, South Tyneside. Uh, we have just had um, the governing body there in public where we have uh, decided to progress with a, a really um, comprehensive um, community model which does have some beds, um, a bed provision within Haven Court and I think will be the envy of lots of um, uh, areas across um, the, the, the the region um, and it, it, as I say I think it, it does really um, give a good uh, service to, to, to local people. Path to excellence um, uh, is the work is still continuing in the background, but as expected, you wouldn't expect us to move forward with a major um, hospital transformation program in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Um, uh, but um, actually, the COVID pandemic is making us really think about how we provide services um, uh, across um, uh, the local area and across larger geographies within the ICP and ICS. And the last point on the on the money, um, uh, very obviously a very very stable financial organisation uh, that spends its money well, but also is shifting um, the the amount the, or the proportion of the spend away from acute services into community services, um, which is exactly the right uh, the, the the right direction. And I think um, everyone needs to be commended on that. So the next slide, if I can. So again, just to build a little bit more on the highlights, um, primary care network development um, and further development uh, needs to needs to happen. There, there are national changes, but how do we locally engage primary care networks and clinical directors um, it, it, uh, in the future and further? And there's a real uh, uh, feel of um, kind of collective working on that. There's a, um, a, a well-structured approach to managing long-term conditions through patient-centered care and innovative ways of looking at how you manage people with multiple medical conditions. Uh, that's particularly strong in South Tyneside. Matthew's already mentioned some of the um, uh, initiatives that have been put in place in 1920 for mental health and learning disabilities. Um, uh, again, which which is a, um, a, a great success. And we've uh, managed to implement some uh, initiatives relating to, uh, to planned care. However, um, as we move forward, the restoration of NHS services and how we um, get um, the show back on the road, if you like, um, uh, and and get our waiting times down and get our cancer standards uh, back to uh, reasonable levels is going to be our uh, biggest challenge in the months to come, particularly with the rising number of COVID cases that have been happening over the last couple of weeks. So next slide, please. So what's next? Um, uh, I think um, uh, we, as a CCG, are um, in a very stable financial position. However, the financial framework for the NHS has uh, changed beyond all recognition in the last six months. Um, and how that um, uh, actually translates into the next financial year, um, I don't think that's clear yet. Um, so it's just um, uh, an element of caution, I think, um, that we need to exercise over the next few months. We need to 
make sure we get value for money in everything that we invest, which I'm confident we do. Um, uh, and um, uh, hopefully the, um, uh, that the kind of financial arrangements of the CCG will become more um, uh, kind of apparent as the year goes on. I've mentioned we need to build our work with the PCNs and, and how do we integrate clinical directors of PCNs with our work that we're doing um, with integrating with the local authority. It's very strong, the integration with the local authority, but I think it needs to go that the, that final step, that step further to really stitch in that um, we as health um, are stand shoulder to shoulder with um, uh, our colleagues in social care to get the best outcomes for uh, the people of South Tyneside. And how do we get the voice of primary care in, into that? Because they are very, very, very important um uh, uh partners within within the community and that the wider community um but again the alliancing model you can see that just needs uh, to continue to be allowed to grow um as well as focusing on that local integration i th don't think anyone can ignore um what's going on with the nhs um, uh, beyond South Tyneside. We are in an um, ICS, an integrated care system, um, and I think ICSs will have a greater um, uh, will have greater importance in, in the future um, and probably will get some level of statutory function in the future, but that's not clear as yet. Um, within the ICS, it's broken into ICPs, of which we are members of, of Integrated Care Partnership with, um, with CCGs um, uh, and foundation trusts and primary care and voluntary sector and local authorities within Sunderland, South Tyneside and County Durham. There are some things that problems that we we are not best um, uh, to solve just on our own in South Tyneside. There are some of the bigger questions and bigger pressures that actually um, uh, do affect the outcomes for our local people that we need to work with our partners on. And that's where the um, uh, ICP and ICS needs to come in. But this uh, just to give uh, members reassurance. Um, this is not about the ICS or ICP taking over what the, all the good work that is done in local places. Place is prime. We need to build from places and only do things away from, uh, well, uh, do things at a higher level, if you like, um, uh, when that makes sense and when it is needed. Um, so, so we will be looking at um, uh, how we uh, work within uh, the integrated care partnership and within the ICS. There's lots of stuff in the news about CCG mergers um, uh, and about one CCG for every ICP or ICS. Just to be absolutely clear, um, this CCG has not made any decisions to merge yet. We do have an open mind about how we would organize ourselves to get the best value for, um, for the NHS. Uh, we are one NHS across the region, um, and we certainly want to work collaboratively in that way. We'll have keep, of course, keep everyone um, apprised of any developments in that area, uh, but we are actively working together as governing bodies and a management team uh, to see how that looks and feels. But there is no current plan um, to merge uh, the, 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 the CCG. Uh, next slide, please. Just last um, couple of slides are some um, uh, just some new faces. Of course, the chap in the top left there, exceptionally handsome bloke who's he. Yes, that's myself. Um, uh, and um, I, as I say, I joined um, in uh, at, the, at the end of uh, March, but we've got some new governing body members. Uh, Louise Lydon, who is a lay member for primary care, who's a local pharmacist, member of the LPC. Um, will not embarrass you to, 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 to kind of wave, but um, uh, you'll, you'll see their faces in a second. John Whitehouse, um, who's the lay member for governance um, and chairs the Audit and Risk Committee. I've known John for quite a while, as he also fulfills that role in County Durham. Um, and Pat Hall, who's a, a lay member for, for quality. Um, uh, and um, Pat also chairs the Quality Patient Safety Committee, um, and John chairs the Audit and Risk Committees. And my final slide, and we've two new um, clinical directors come on. Uh, John Toes, who I know you've all known for a long time, has uh, 
has um, uh, left as, as a clinical director. Um, he is still engaged, though, um, in work in South Tyneside in Health Pathways, uh, but he's moved on to a partnership in uh, Manchester, I believe. Um, so it is re a real uh, warm welcome to uh, Jen Hunter and Nusha Ali, um, who are joined our executive and, and our um, uh, management team within the CCG. And uh, they have some particular interests around PCN development, um, uh, cancer, palliative care, uh, medicines management and frailty, which I think is really valuable um, that we make sure we've got that really strong clinical voice in every part of our um, organisation. So that's all I uh, wanted to say, but of course, I'm happy uh, to take any questions from anyone or any comments. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Neil, for that update. The only question I have is that I need to know how you do these uh, these putting pictures on so so you get narrower, but everybody else gets wider. So I need to work out how to do those sorts of presentations. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Could I be a little bit more serious, colleagues? I, I, I'm sure that a lot of that is not news to uh, to, to members uh, around the table. Uh, of the governing body, but does they, if anybody does have any uh, particular questions or comments for for any of us at, at this stage, or any any more sort of wider reflections from the from members of the governing body, than that they'd, they'd be most welcome. Uh, Jeanette, you're waving your hand at me. Thank you, Jay. Yes, I think it's just always a great opportunity, the AGM, to reflect on all of the work that the CCG has been involved in with its partners and um, with the clinical leadership in the organisation. Uh, from a finance point of view, I think it's so easy as you're moving through the year to take for granted the amount of work and the amount of progress. So when you, when you have the opportunity in the AGM to look at it in its totality, it's always very refreshing to see just how much we have achieved and um, how hard people are working. Yeah, good yeah. Indeed. Vicky? Yeah, thank you, Matthew. I would just um, echo kind of Jeanette's point there and, and Neil's point in terms of we keep using the word partnership this morning, it keeps coming up. So um, it, it's that point about, you know, that is really strong in South Tyneside. We do really well in terms of what we achieve because of our partnerships and our relationships. Um, and we need to continue to build on that and strengthen that through the work that we're doing in terms of integration. But that's what makes us um, good. And that's how we, you know, do the, the really strong work that we do together. It's through those relationships and partnerships. And I think further reflection on that is that we have to acknowledge the potential risk of new ways of working and of, of working remotely and of not actually seeing each other face to face as being something that potentially could hold back some of that, uh, that partnership working. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that we try extra hard during this period to make sure that we maintain and, uh, and strengthen all of those, uh, those relationships that are the underlying reason for the success of a lot of what's been going on in South Tyneside. Matt? Uh, yeah, just briefly, and Kate might want to um, go on this, but I think you know, I'm really proud to be part of the South Tyneside team. I think it's fantastic, not just you know, in the organisation, but, but more broadly, I think we work really well together and I think we achieve a lot difficult decisions actually that perhaps others may, may not seek to take. So I'm really proud of that. I, I do just want to um, say a big thank you to all the staff in our partners but also particularly in the in the ccg and the college work with us because it's been a really challenging last six months i know the agm's looking back but you know covid hit in january for every march didn't it and those our staff have worked incredibly hard in very difficult circumstances often to really get the best they can for our patients and our residents so i think for me it was just i wanted to put testament out to the staff staff our organization and our partners yeah i will echo all of that i can see from the nods on my screen that everybody feels the same way uh, and we must sort of think about uh, what we can do to uh, to thank the staff and to support the staff uh, going forward as well i think that's something that the uh, uh, the executive team might want to uh, to consider um, uh, for how we how we do that in the future any further comments questions from from colleagues no. i have been keeping an eye on the um whether there's been anything further coming through in terms of interaction from members of the public by the website. I haven't, uh, haven't seen anything landing in my email box. Matt, I, I, I'm just 
looking to you to double check operationally there's nothing coming through from from your perspective that, that you're getting that I'm not getting. I, I don't believe so, although my inbox was quite full of various um, ish, various emails up from the last week, so I, I can't see anything that's come through new to you today. OK, well, we'll have to take it that uh, technology uh, depending, uh, we, we certainly haven't received any uh, anything further from, from members of the public. Uh, so I think it's probably wise to uh, to end the uh, the AGM there at that uh, at that point, we'll uh, members if you could uh, stay on the line um, just for some some brief reflections. We always do a sort of uh, a moment of reflection on on a meeting so we can improve for the next meeting before we um, before we we go on. So uh, if we can pause the live stream, that would be great. Uh, anybody who's interested in live streaming later, uh, we will be having the primary care committee back at the uh, at the appropriate time. But if we can pause the live stream now, that would be fine.